right, bitches? Technical distributors, unpossible. 15 gets 15 you 15% off. Don't touch the wolf. 15% off. 15. Unpossible 15. Gets you 15% right off. Technical distributors. Technical distributors, unpossible 15. So does anyone else's ear just like go what? really loud all the time after yeah. silencers are important? Silencers are. I wouldn't know because I planned ahead and had silencers. <laughs> Those are pretty good too. Those cans you had. Yeah. So my man Jay. Hello. We're back. I'm in a new seat. It's in our blood though. It so is So we're, we're going to get after it, new seat or not. So we're here with um, Nick, Drew, and Mitch, three of the engineers yep. at the fabulous Q. Uh, that went with us on our trip to Africa. Yes. And so none of you motherfuckers ever been to Africa. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, I'm sure Jay's flown missions over there, but. Allegedly. I've been to Morocco, but that was pretty far from where we were. Yes. Isn't this Africa? That counts? Yes. I didn't know that. Did you go in like to Browning or whatever? Or Yeah, it was like in Portugal and we took a side trip down because it's easy to get to from Spain. So Yeah. And yeah, it was awesome. But it's totally different. Time. It's like South Africa, but totally different in every way. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> not like South Africa. It's more like Boston than South Africa. Um, oh, well, that was cool. I didn't know. Okay. So, yeah. Counts. Doesn't count. Um, so, you guys had, had never gone, but you all have hunted. You've all shot a fair amount. All have experience with the fix and various other rifles. A fair amount. Fair amount. <laughs> a little bit. Fair amount. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. So, uh Oh, did you see this fix, by the way, that somebody sent us while we were gone? I think that's uh, recycled skateboards um, carved into a little fix. Did you guys see that? That nice. is freaking awesome, isn't it? Ultralight. It is. It's the compact. That's the 2.2 version people keep asking about. Um, so whoever sent that, thank you. That is awesome, and we'll stay in the podcast room. Uh, so, dudes, let's get into it. What was – what do you, what do you guys think? And the plane ride was awesome. It was for me because I had like you know I, I was up there where where the you know <laughs> the players play yeah and I had my own little pod I was laid back watching movies getting service <laughs> <laughs> service on yourself by that yeah. I mean like macaroni and cheese and I really uh, enjoyed our, our Croc gang pictures cause yes you could tell we were Americans because like six of us had Crocs on oh Crocs I you lost guys all wore Crocs <laughs> I actually yeah. lost a pair of Crocs and Newark uh, on the way back well just half a pair. Yeah, half a pair. <laughs> Somebody stole one? No, it just got stuck in like the <laughs> x ray machine. We had, we had like 30 out. minutes until our flight, and Jay's like, ah, fuck it, I'm, we're leaving. Yeah, so I kicked my other croc <laughs> off and threw on other <laughs> shoes and took off. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we, we can probably get you reimbursed for some crocs. That'd be tight. <laughs> Although, all $20. <laughs> well, I, I tried to get some of those um, after listening to you idiots. I tried to, I went to Kittery, got me some slip on boots yesterday. And they had the Crocs with the fuzzy inside. And I was like, hey, I'm going to get some. Mm -hmm. And I got some. They were camo, like just white trash, totally. And uh, I throw them down, put my feet in them. I'm like, ah. I was like, I'm going to get them. Turn around, pick my boots up. Ivanka picked them up, hung them back up. <laughs> she was like, you are not that old yet. You're yeah, I don't know who would have a pair of those. Yeah. They felt great, though. So, I mean, I, I've been opposed to this. I mean, for 10 years, people have been trying to get me to wear them. Friends. It's like they massage your feet while you walk. They got these little studs in the bottom. They're great. Yeah. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, that's pretty good. So, um, I don't know. What should we get started with? I, I don't even know how to get started with this. Well, I mean, what was this whole trip the, for? Um, that's a good point, Jay. You're oh, pulling Kill. your fucking weight. Season son. two, I'm back. Um, <laughs> well, let's just say you're here. <laughs> <laughs> back means you were, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I took you guys to Africa for several reasons. Um, you know, you know, for me selfishly, I want to take you guys because I want you guys to have an experience. You know, something that's changed my life and it's awesome and that maybe you know you guys would never take the time opportunity to spend the resource to go and do um so that's one part of it for me another part is for us to test the guns that we've got another part is to test new things we're developing and then another selfish well i guess all these are selfish parts for me 
But then as for us to go over with 6.5 and 8.6 and then show you guys why we need the mega fix or the proper fix, we need a big cartridge gun. Um, you know, when they're giant and what, what, Drew, what are you doing? Sorry, turn my phone off. Look. You don't turn it off by texting someone telling them to turn it off. <laughs> I had to swipe down the things. So, yeah. um, well, well, well. And you're breaking my rhythm. I'm starting to flow. Uh, s- 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 fuck. Let's just start. <laughs> <laughs> big fix. Oh, yeah. Big calibers fix, yeah. and shooting yeah, animals. Yeah, so big calibers because there we can shoot big animals, but also far. And I feel like there's nothing I can't kill with. 308, 65, 86 in a reasonable range. But when we start talking, we, you know, we had the ability, like I shot a blessed buck at 950. Jared shot one at 1150. We all had that opportunity. Um, yeah, and you start talking about a 16-inch 65. It's, it's more like ethical decisions, like your bullet performance out to those longer ranges might not yeah. be great on big animals. And That's right. Uh, having a little bit more, being a little more comfortable, a couple of extra hundred yards makes a difference between looking at an animal or like having to stalk up close to it. Yeah. Or a couple extra seconds, which you might not have. Yeah. Like yeah. That, yeah. that I mean, was, well, that was one thing that the pH has kind of told all of us is that, um, most of the time guys aren't shooting beyond 200, 300 because that's for, their capability. Right. And for the first couple of days, I don't think there was a shot taken under 300. I think yeah, everyone I was, no. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, yeah. think, think about this. So, Nick and Mitch and I have hunted a fair amount. Drew's relatively new to it. And, well, you never shot anything bigger than like a raccoon until we went over yeah, there? no big game at all. So what was your first shot? 720 yards on a red hearted beast. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't it 720 yards off, off the of ass of the red hearted beast? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was underneath it. Oh, okay. And then he scattered a little bit, and then he settled down, and then I... Dropped him one shot. You're Two shooting. shots. Okay. But. Well, with you, with you taking it, all right. A first round, you shoot right under over something, wind, that environment, and Mitch is talking shit. So, I, okay. So, <laughs> so Drew's first animal ever. Second shot. I, I mean, and to me, people can talk all the shit they want shooting targets. When you're out there and you're in the field and it's a live animal, it's different stress and adrenaline. And you blow a first shot. I mean, to me, that's not even blowing a shot because it's it's like how much experience do you have with wind and all these other things. To be able to to you know collect yourself and then figure out what you did wrong, make a correction, and make a good shot. That's harder to me than first shot. Mm-hmm. Like oh, yeah. first shot, you're kind of guessing at that distance with some wind, and especially out there on, on the top. I assume you sh- shot it somewhere where it was very open. I wasn't there. Yeah, it was pretty open and flat, not a whole lot of incline. So it was, and we had just come from, it was kind of pretty good conditions. That's why I stayed calm because we had just come from the range yeah. that they had set up. So we were just plinking plates from 300 out to 1,000. So I was actually very confident in that shot. Towards the end of the trip, like a little bit less. Like, <laughs> be more be more reserved with your shots. But you like can. we had just come from the range. I was set yeah. up. Real good, and I was like, I can make the shot all day. Oh, well, that's. I and mean, then I didn't. <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but I think it. I mean that's going to happen. Whether I mean because if you take a shot, make a perfect shot at seven twenty, an animal can take a step and move mm-hmm. two or three feet, and you and it a perfect shot's turned into a bad shot. Um, but to be able to you know follow that up with a good shot, because I mean with that said, let's call Mitch out. What was your longest shot over there, Mitch? Mm, Five twenty. Oh. Oh. So, it's so interesting. D- yeah. So, Drew, if, I mean, basically, if he added 50% to his longest shot, that was your shot. I, I did also have a 22-inch <laughs> yeah, barrel. Yeah, and I will give him less some credit on that. Ooh, that's yeah. right. Well, it's something else I wanted to talk about was, and I'm going to scatter it all over the place. Jesus. Six. Yeah. But that is something I want to talk about is different setups and everything. But but we'll get there. So, um, that was incredible. What do you think after this? This is like your first day there. I'm not even now. I'm still in Mozambique, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, Jared Joplin took a video of it and it was pretty funny, but I'm just like, just get this rush over my body. It was weird feeling, but just like adrenaline and just like my skin was warm and I was just like, Oh, I was like, is this what this feels like? I was like, so amped up. It felt so good. And then Seppi told me to get out of the truck and follow the tracker. <laughs> and I was like, all right, let's keep them like within 200 yards from now on. Because with the Seppi altitude and everything, I get out there and Desmond's like, 
Is, well, okay. Is well, he's like good. Seppi is your PH. Yes, and, sorry. Seppi is the PH. Desmond's, Desmond's, Desmond's the tracker. The tracker. Yeah. We have a uh, clip of that, so we'll roll it right now. Nice. Oh. Is this what this feels like? Yeah. This is fucking amazing. That's called success. But yeah, I follow him out there, and then we get halfway there, and I'm just done. Because, one, I'm not in shape. And two, you smoke altitude. all the time. And yeah, we're at <laughs> Only <altitude>. on vacation. <laughs> and and the altitude, and I was just absolutely dead. And then I look up, and I look around, and I'm like, if Desmond wasn't here, I'd be like, I'd just sit down and just be like, this is where I died. Yeah, so Desmond, we should show another picture of Desmond. So Desmond grew up there, and he's a native, and um, looks like he runs marathons. And I've seen him get tired once, and he was yeah carrying an animal by himself, and we were at like 7,000 feet. Yeah. He's a he's an animal. You weren't there for it, but when we were, when we were in the airport, uh, you guys did a little calculation on how many beers we would need. Uh, <laughs> did we reach that number? It was a reasonable estimation. It's yeah. not like it's new ground for us. So no. We did like, it was, you know, it's like whatever, 15, 20 beers a day per guy for this many days. Is, you know, it's like 800 beers. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> funny because, I mean, we're like day two for you guys and we're driving down from Mozambique and I'm hearing phone calls between Andrew, the owner, and Rad like the head PHs with me. And Red's like, hey, you know, we're four hours out and he's getting things. And he's like, these motherfuckers are drinking all the beer. <laughs> he's like, please stop and get beer and water. And we had to load the truck down with beer and water. That's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. but that was day one. And then after that, I was like, I'm never, <laughs> I ever. Say. Like when you're dead out there trying to walk around and dehydrate, it doesn't help at all. So I was mm. like, not, not, no. He's got a yeah. drink now, Drew, water yeah, he, with your beer. He hammered down. He, he doubles down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Drew picked up everyone's slack. Yeah. I did what I could. Well, was that was that your favorite? Um, was that make the biggest impression on you? Is that not necessarily your favorite hunt, but one of the most memorable things? Because shout out to Crusader Safari. So, you know, that's where I'm building the lodge. And the first thing they did was they're like, what do you want here to continue to bring your guys and people over here? And I'm like, we need a thousand yard range because they've got land. It's like not a big deal. And they built us an awesome range. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got steel. We've got paper at one and 200. We've got steel from 300 out to a thousand. They built us a, a tower that um that we shoot from the top of they're putting the roof wasn't on when they're putting a thatch roof on it so we can shoot there in the summer but that was so helpful because you know we all had our dope here but to go there and yeah use the kestrel and everything and y y you know modify your dope and then be able to confirm on steel because mm -hmm. you know i think at 400 wasn't it like 400 the, the steel is only like six inches or something it wasn't that big i mean yeah. we yeah. We shot, like, at least Nick and I did. We shot and shot and shot, like, as much as we could before going. Just, yeah, we practiced yeah, a lot. Like, wanted to be really solid and then be able to adjust our dope when we got there. Yeah. Like, we both sat down on the bench, and within three minutes, like, we're done. Like, just done. Out to a 1,000. Such ready to go. a good feeling. Yeah. Even with the range, <clears> though, too, like, you kind of touched on it before, the terrain is so crazy there that even, like, that first day, we spent some time at the range. Like, you guys shot a bunch. And then... Just the diff, like, I don't know how much experience you guys have with wind, but like, it was impossible to tell there. Like, specifically the wildebeest that you shot from one side of a canyon to another side of a canyon, there was no wind where we were. There was no wind that we could really see where yeah. it was. And that bullet went a wildebeest behind. And I was holding the wind. Right. Like, I knew there was wind in the middle, so. Well, yeah. It's interesting, too, in that situation, if you're shooting in one of those canyons or in um, a bowl, the. Like I made a shot where my first shot, I felt completely confident on a, on a folly at uh, under 500 for something. But um, the wind caused my elevation to shift. Enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a small animal. And so I missed with the first shot and just looked at my reticle, held the miss, held that, bam, heart shot. Um So it's interesting. It's like when you think about wind, you normally think of, you know, windage right. left and right. But when, when you're shooting in a canyon, it can affect your elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that, that happened to me firsthand. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the same. I, well, actually, Jay called the – I was coming out of recoil. I didn't see the, the impact. He called the impact. I adjusted one wildebeest to the right and sent another <laughs> one. Yeah, and you, and you <laughs> and, slapped it. And slapped him a second shot. It was like 535 across that Yeah, canyon. that first but one. Yeah. It was wild. I, I, 
I had to think about it later. It was probably a mil and a half of wind. And it was dead where we were, yeah. and it was dead on the other side. That's a it lot. It was insane. That's wild. Yeah. That's a lot. But because, okay, so uh, Nick and Mitch, you guys were using 16-inch 6.5. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were all using 143 LDX. Drew, you had your 22-inch barrel. I did, yeah. Yeah, so Jared used mine while he was there, and then I used it, and I stayed after you guys and, and went to the Winterberg Mountains and did some of uh, the technical animals. And, and I put that 22-inch barrel on my gun, and um, used it. That extra, that extra, uh, what's it? Six inches makes a world of difference. Mm-hmm. It it is way easier and for me, but it sucks carrying that gun around. It's a heavy barrel. It's long. It's not convenient in the truck. I can't shoot out the window quick. We see a jackal or something. So there's parts of it I didn't like, but it made it easier when you laid down to shoot something. It definitely wore down on me a little bit by the end. The weight, like it didn't feel that much at the beginning obviously but yeah. after a couple of days of lugging that thing around it's just like man i kind of wish i had a 16 but you know take your trades i wouldn't have taken that shot that first day at that harder beast if i had a 16 probably no that's that's, that's that, questionable that been, yeah that would have been very, to 600 that would have been very sketchy so like yeah. you know it's a trade-off there was times where i was really glad to have that 16 because i my ph seppi and i were like actually running through the bush uh, quite a bit like uh, and I mean there's times when you're like literally crawling trying to get under that 16 inch barrel is nice yeah. yeah it was so slick well what's it what was your what was your whole setup 16 inch 6.5 Creedmoor I had a March uh, 3 to 24 um, our awesome. new what, our new bipod. Did you have yeah, the, the, the new bipod? Yeah, which the kickstand is a game changer you like, use it um, the G sling you use our new sling oh yeah mm-hmm. which yeah, I was really, really happy with that. I was going to, like, I had a Those Mac that don't one. know Mitch, yeah. oh, my God, if he's giving compliments to something he didn't work on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's, like, I was going to bring, I just had a Magpul one that I've just been using for a couple of years, and it's so much, RG sling is so much lighter. It's, it is a huge difference, and it's just, like, you don't even realize it's on the gun, because it's just, yeah. like, it's tiny. Yeah, that's it's what I noticed with the kickstand, too, because I think... Yeah. Nick and Mitch, you used one. I had one. Yeah, the three of us. And this that 16 inch gun, because I use the 16 inch gun some with the uh, Vortex one to ten uh, reptilia mount, our G sling, um, the kickstand, and that is a phenomenal, phenomenal setup. I mean, I shot some stuff over 500 with it, and I watched Rad, who um, I was like, Rad, I'm buying. So we we called some animals while we were over there, and my PH, I was like. I made him shoot. It's like, I'm buying you some animals. I want you to shoot some. I was like, when's the last time you've shot like an animal, like with a client or a trophy animal or something? He's been like, five years. <laughs> you know, like he only shoots to back someone up. And I'm like, man, okay, so we're going to shoot like 100 animals culling. Like I'm paying for some for you. And uh, he shot, I watched him shoot a black wildebeest facing us with my setup. So with a 1 to 10 Vortex, 16 inch, 65 Creedmoor. 535 yards it was facing us shot it in the chest bam down like that was that was pretty awesome and i watched him head shoot uh a blessed bucket 325 with it nice it's pretty great it was yeah. crazy to see all i mean you talked about it um going to africa before but seeing all of their reactions to not only the guns that we brought but like we brought a bunch of g-slings and left most of them there like yeah you leave them for the phs yeah like mm-hmm. i I mean, Tommy and I had G-slings on our cameras. Everything that we had, um, we we used them for those. And then, yeah, it, the pHs were just everything that we brought. They were kind of like blown away by all of it. Um, and they'll get yeah. real use out of it too. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're 10 years or so behind us. So, I mean, you know, and it seems stupid. Like some people say, oh, it's so stupid. A sling's not that heavy. But when you look at the gun as a system and you start taking weight out of everything however much it you can that's unnecessary i mean at the end of it you end up with something much lighter and and i don't care even with our gun weighing six pounds and a few ounces when i put a harris or an atlas bipod on it i hate to sling and carry that gun i'll never do it again no like i i've shot off a of harris's my entire life and it's they're like, great I'm didn't you done. Even, didn't you even put yours back on there for like a a couple hours and then well, I put it on that mini fix that oh, I yeah, was yeah. carrying and I was like, "Well, this is stupid." But but how <laughs> low profile the, the yeah. kickstand is, and then mm-hmm. you, you don't look at you it, don't notice like, the weight on the gun. It's not that much. Like you you think, well, it's not that much narrower. But then, like as you're walking miles or running through the brush, like that thing's scraping on your gut. 
or just getting hung up that much more. It's just those tiny little differences actually yeah. are important. I, I mean, because we know, I mean, you guys, especially dealing with numbers all the time and educating me, it's like 20% of something is huge. Mm-hmm. That's a huge amount. When you start adding that to not just one part of the gun, but we take that approach to the entire gun, the, the entire system, that's fucking wonderful. But that, I think, is probably 50% the width of a mm. Harris. I don't know. You guys probably know the number. And lower profile. It doesn't rattle. And it weighs half as much. Yeah, I mean, under nine ounces. I mean, I mean, our cans aren't heavy, and it's half the weight of a Thunder Chicken. You know, it's like you're not – it really makes a huge difference. And just to set the scene a little, like we're, we do a lot of riding around in trucks going from spot to spot and – I don't think a lot of people wear wear a gun over their shoulder front slung for eight straight days for eight hours a day. Like you start mm-hmm. to appreciate every single ounce that isn't hanging off of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, and, the, the and the pH is too. The first, my first trip or two over there, they're like, why do you carry your gun that way? And then it's like, okay, we turn a corner and, you know, there there's a jackal or there's a bush, whatever the thing is. It's like, oh, bam, I can shoot in like half a second. Where's your gun? It's like that's right. why you carry a gun on you carry a gun that way too when it's lightweight it's comfortable and you have access to it and control over it it can shoot very quickly instead of worrying about where the gun is you're worried about you're looking at animals like yeah it, yeah it's you just know where it is all the time it's comfortable it's like you're just so much more focused on what's around you it's, yeah it's nice one yeah. thing that i didn't i'm not i'm not sure if you guys had any sort of um expectation but i anticipated like you said, you drive around a lot kind of spot to spot and I anticipated it's just like a, cause it's all free range. It's not a high fence at all. It's tons of land. It's target rich, but I kind of anticipated like you, you drive to a spot, you stop, you see, and you shoot, you don't shoot from the truck, but you shoot around the truck, whatever. And I guess you probably could hunt that way if you really wanted to, but we even, didn't. De- yeah, exactly. And depending on what you're trying to hunt, like it was absolutely not that way. I mean, we, we're humping up and down mountains and through brush, like you said, like cliffs, everything you can imagine. And beforehand, I never cared about, I was always in the camp of like the guns light enough. Who cares about the scope being a couple ounces heavier or the bipod or whatever? Like you already have a light gun. Who cares about those extra? But I didn't carry a gun around as much as you guys did, but I carried a heavy ass camera and tripod around and was like, this sucks. Like I get it. You want the lightest, everything you can get. Well, we even in switched your camera over to one of our shooting tripods, right? Yeah. Just to get some speed and some... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because carrying that big freaking camera tripod's a nightmare. Yep. Well, J- adjusting one leg at a time. Right. Taking... I mean, there... Well, there's just also very few people who are so fit that you go there. And, you know, here we're at sea level. And there you're like 6,000 feet. Yeah. Where you do that and, okay, we're sitting here on our asses all day. We go to the range sometimes and you go over there and it's like you, it's physical for half the day you're out like you're hiking mountains you're, and you're carrying stuff like everything you're carrying begins to be a burden it's so mm-hmm. different than you know just yeah going to the range and having your gun and it not feeling heavy okay go hike a mountain for six hours with it and tell me you wouldn't like for it to be two pounds lighter and it's not like a relaxed hike like sometimes it is you're just kind of going spot to spot but when it's on, like Nick touched on it before, everything is so fast. Like when you see them, yeah. you got to get to them, and then you got to put a shot on. Yeah, and I mean, and sometimes like, what you giggling about? Uh, <laughs> I just, we were we were trying to film. I shot a wildebeest with an oh, eight yeah, six Creedmoor, and like you know, we had what <laughs> eight six blackout. Blackout. Right? <laughs> um, we uh, you know, Tommy and Jay and I had this little discussion in the, the car. Like we're gonna communicate. Like. When it's, you know, we're going to get on the animal, get set up. Everybody's going to be good to go. And yeah, like, it works we're, out sometimes. We're creeping over this hill, and and there's a wildebeest right below us. And uh, Seppi's like, let's shoot this bull. Like, let's, let's call this one. And uh, Jay's, like, getting the camera set up. And I'm like, Jay, do you see him? And Jay's like, yeah. Yeah, I see him. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, he saw me. It was good. But yeah, totally missed the shot just because it was like, you know, you only have seconds. That yeah. wildebeest was like one second away because the one behind him had leapt off was like gone oh so yeah like especially the second. wildebeest they just Ooh. run and oh, run yeah. and oh they never said but like well i mean that's the three thing seconds too. to shoot being a second faster is everything yeah well, well with marketing i mean if it's me it's one thing but i take you guys over there i hope to get marketing footage out of it which we got a lot of great footage hopefully and if 
<laughs> Tommy did a good job. Uh, so yeah, props to Thomas and Jay. Like, yeah. it's really difficult to get quality footage. You got five guys so, trying to trail through the so brush, but stay for, hidden. But for you guys, to me, it's not just for marketing. It's for you guys too. So if you, you know, yeah. if you got the shot, you got to take the shot. That you was, know, for me, if I don't get to take the shot because they're not on it, well, it sucks. But that's part of it. it. We'll wait and we'll find something else, or we'll, you know, get back after that one and we'll try to get the shot. That was the big thing for me, and part of the reason I switched to the we had those like Jim Shockey trigger sticks, shooting sticks. I switched over to those because. I was stressing out about having to make whoever, these guys specifically, but anyone shooting for me to be like, no, hold on, give me a second, because I know how fast it, or how quick it happens. I was stressing out about like, just take the fucking shot. Like, don't wait on me. And then Tommy kind of kept me grounded and was like, no, 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 we're here to get this footage. They will wait for you. But it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's never, it's never going to be perfect. And to me, I'm fine with that. That's, you know, we want people to understand because I want, you know, I've fallen in love with hunting and I want other people to do it. And going to Africa is so different than hunting here and so inspiring and just, and we can learn so much as a company. I mean, think of all the things we learned that will go into, you know, we're already, I mean, yesterday, Matt, you know, his intern, he brought me modifications to the bipod that we wouldn't have made had we not gone on that hunt, mm-hmm. which are way better. And he's already done it. And you know, um, these are things that, it, that I hope we get out of this. But then, you know, just for me, like wanting to get people to go over there because I want the fix to be the next generation's hunting rifle. And I also want the next generation to hunt more than I think my generation has. And, and just w- what a difference it makes in your life. I mean, I don't know how you guys felt about the trip after, but I mean, every time I go and I get home, you know, and I get to hug and kiss my family and hang out for two days, I'm ready to go back. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's what I want to be doing. Um, and when I found out that you can go over there and you can shoot five, seven animals and have a week long trip where you're catered to, you get this awesome adventure and it's the price of going and shooting a mule deer in America. Like you're crazy not to try to do this. Um, anyway. Okay. Mitch, that was your setup. 16 inch fix. With the March, which a lot of people won't know what that is, a Japanese optic, they're awesome. They make a lot of compact mm-hmm. reel. Um, they were doing pretty big power ranges before everyone else. Uh, cool optics. A lot of guys shooting target mm-hmm. use them. It's that's a of compact the, scope. Yeah, it's small and it actually, like the turret system is simple and well thought out. The zero stop is real simple. And it's actually got a decent reticle for hunting. So, like, yeah. you have, like, I mean, there was cases where I dialed, like, when I shot my Kudu. I sat there for 30 minutes watching the thing, waiting for it to take one step. So, you know, I, I dialed and was, I didn't have to think about holdover. But yeah. for a quick shot, you know. But you're able to hold with it. Yeah, having a reticle you can hold over is really important. Yeah. Drew, what was what was your setup? Um, I had 22-inch 6.5 barrel. I had the Voodoo 5 to 25 scope on it. And then I had the uh, Atlas bipod. I had my... Amazon, it's not even mine. I think Ethan bought it. Just some Amazon Atlas knockoff. And right before we go, Colin's like, sees my gun as I'm packing. And he's like, you're not taking that thing, are you? I was like, yeah. And he went and gave me his. That's, that's good looking out, Colin. Yeah. For you. And, trying no, to and I, like really appreci- I really appreciate it because it made a difference not having to fumble with it for 10 minutes. So the real Atlas is better than the Wish Atlas? Yes. Yeah. But still felt a little slow to deploy. Like I, I missed a baboon because I couldn't get the legs out in time and it was, yeah. it was like... You, the the Atlas know. looks good and all, and it's a fine bipod. But and it's re- it's relatively light compared to Harris and... No, it's the same stuff. as a Harris. Really? I, was say, I think, yeah. yeah, that's the Aren't funny they? thing. Is, I think it looks lighter. 16 inches, or ounces, or both. Yeah, it, it looks just lighter. just inches well. today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking about, you know, Full sex bags, and kudu. Horns. <laughs> um, okay, well, Nick, what was your setup? Yeah, Mitch and I basically run identical setups because we spend every minute of our lives together and arrive at the same decisions so it's yeah gross. i have a 16 inch 65 with the same with well march the march scopes we bought three at the same time so we have we have the same ones well, uh, well i had the first prototype kickstand mm-hmm. um which was awesome mostly just for testing invaluable stuff then i'll add we also shot the um bottle rocket Brakes mm. on oh. top of oh, the oh yeah, 
and it was a nightmare. Like it was oh. terrible for everyone. Yeah. Um, except recoil. Except for me. <laughs> yeah. Except for the shooter, which were they're they're definitely better for recoil. So they help a lot with recoil. They're yep. just yeah. miserably yeah. loud. Yeah. For everyone else, like spotting yourself, camera guys. Your yeah, pH's. you guys are rude. I use the um, whistle tip when yeah. I don't have a silencer because yeah, I'm trying not to deafen everybody else. We shot off tripods practicing, and it was like night and day. Like yeah, the whistle tip versus the bottle rocket. Like yeah. you're just that much faster to get back on a shot. But it's true. If I'd have known we were going to shoot that much without hearing protection, I probably would have shot the the whistle tip and yeah. handled the recoil because yeah. the noise is just. And hunting without silencers yeah. is terrible. I'm so recoil did. sensitive, but I hate the noise way more than I hate getting kicked. And yeah. it's not like you can't wear plugs. Like day one, I had like I got these custom molded mm -hmm. ones, but then I can't hear shit, so I can't hear the pH telling me which one to shoot. Yeah, if it's it, okay it, to it shoot. It is very aggravating. It's ridiculous. It's it's bad for the animal. It's bad for the hunter. Everything about not being allowed to use silencers is bad. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing beneficial to it. What did he say? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. no, I was like just going through my experience with my setup. I think on the lightweight guns, you appreciate it all of the time that you're not shooting super far. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just have to pay more attention. So you got some bullet performance difference out there at the 600 plus yards range. Yeah. You don't have to worry about it too much inside that. But what I think I learned the most in the first couple of days was really paying attention to your follow through because you can jerk those little guns around a lot easier than mm -hmm. the big ones yeah and just making sure you're not yanking shots all over because like, yeah. you get so excited it's just like you said like we we shoot a relatively large amount of steel but they don't there's no consequence of missing those like when there's an animal in your scope everything changes no matter how many times you've done it yeah and yeah I I, mean, and I'm, I'm glad for that like that's the best part is that it's always exciting yeah i mean i i think i probably shot 150 animals this year maybe definitely over a hundred and I still get just as excited every, every time. And I mean, I think, and I'll stop, I'm sure when that's gone, but I mean, that's one thing, you know, you just love about hunting. Like you, you guys grew up with it. I've, I did not. And, but you know, now it's as I've been hunting almost 15 years and I've shot a lot and I still get more. I think it's just like with guns, with the industry, I'm just as excited or more excited about the stuff we're doing than I was, you know, 25 years ago. And hunting to me is, is, is you know, like our, our com I'm married to our company, but hunting is my girlfriend. You know, that's, I, I, I love it. But it, it is hard to explain if you've not gone and done it. Like people who love shooting and shooting targets. And, you know, I, when I was a kid, I thought just rednecks hunted and stuff and I didn't understand it. But now it's like I'm getting into the conservation side of it and understanding that. And, and I want all the experiences. When I read about Roosevelt or Hemingway and these other great hunters, um, you know, Corbett, who did all the line, uh, tigers and leopard in India. And, you know, I bought a double just like his because that's like, man, I want these experiences. I want to go experience every one of these things before they tell us we can't. And, you know, like I, I when you guys first got there, I was in Mozambique and I was on a dangerous game hunt. And I'm going to get into that later. Well, by the time this comes out, I mean, it'll be known. But, yeah, I shot a lion. And that was a the most difficult hunt I've ever done. And the consequences were severe. Like if you fuck it up, you get killed. And that is a whole like another level of rush and just interesting. And the hunt was hard and it's so different. And, um, but all these adventures, man, I mean, I just feel so fortunate because I feel, you know, it's so taboo. People post the pictures and get eaten up by it. And it, it's just all ignorance, just like all the shit we see going on in our own country. But all these people have opinions about Africa that aren't over there. And you guys saw the benefit of it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there. I mean, it's almost a caste system there. But it's like there's people that don't want to change their lives. But then the benefit that hunting brings to Africa and the conservation and what that actually pays for, like it's the only reason there are animals left in Africa is because there are hunters. And then the local communities because, you know, like I killed a lion and the local community had, had been – displaced and a, a company a family that does hunting in africa bought the property that the this community so it was like a tribe or a village people would call it and they have a chief and that's uh, you know that's an inherited position within the community and they um killed all the lions there was a huge lion and elephant and leopard 
and uh, the community conflict because the community raises uh, sheep and they raise cattle. And so to them, the lion, it's really easy. There's tons of lions in their area where I was, like tons. And in some areas in Africa, they're not. They're not. And you shouldn't hunt them because there aren't very many. Or there's not very many leopard in certain areas, and you shouldn't hunt them. But in this area, the elephant, leopard, and lion population is huge. And these people are just living there for thousands of years trying to survive, and they raise cattle. So everyone in the community, all they do is set snares, and they poison the lions. Like the lion to them is like a coyote to us or a buzzard or something. It's like a nuisance and there was no value to the lions. And so this company bought the property, worked a deal out with the government and the community and, and the tribal elders and the chief to move them, um, you know, several miles away and to build them all new houses and to put up one fence, one barrier, just a single row. And it's like a big high, high fence to keep all those animals out. But it's not fencing in their community or the hunting property, just a barrier. And it's to try to keep, reduce that conflict where these people can raise cattle. They're not being poached constant, or, the, the, you know, the cattle's not being killed by all the lions. And they don't snare them. Like, that's, they kill all the lions if you're not there hunting. And that's what I think, like, Americans don't understand. It, it's, it's like that conflict. I mean, your family, on both your family's farm, but your family, huge farmers. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if there were, like, an ele- like if there were elephants and your family's doing corn, would come in there and, like, a big herd of elephants, you know, 100 acres of corn in two days, it's gone. Mm-hmm. So what would your family do if that's what it did to survive? You know, like, they end up killing all the elephants because it's a huge nuisance. And so that's what's happened. And so now the, the, some enterprising people, these communities are real happy and they're thriving more. And then people in those communities now, who was our cook, who was our maid, who are our trackers, who are our skinners. So my lion hunt for 15 days employed 10 of those people. And it's half the money in 10 days they'll make for the year. Mm-hmm. And just going and supporting that. And these are things that they were killing and just leaving and there was no value to them anyway. So to them, it's like, it's freaking wonderful. So they get a portion of the money, they got new homes, and then it's a big deal. The chief actually, the, the agreement is he has rights to the lion. And so he eats the lion to show like how, well, I don't know, it's like an ego thing or whatever, some cultural thing with him. And I would not eat the lion. I mean, <laughs> I, I would try it because I killed it. But yeah, yeah. I think it's not like a thing, but he gets it. And you're not even supposed to like gut it or anything before you give it to him. So like the day I shot the lion, that evening he got the lion and he eats it and it's like a big celebration for the community and they come and they sing like this song for us and everything it was it was kind of strange um but it was like awesome and people think oh these you know we're going over there and raping and pillaging this entire continent <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they are so freaking grateful this is how they have electricity this is how they have running water this is how they eat you know this is how they have money for clothes and, you know, to them, it's like stupid Americans. You come over here and shoot these lions that we would just catch in snares and shoot with a twenty two in the head anyway. Well, I mean, we we did it here. Changed the landscape to make room for cows. They did the same thing there a couple yeah. hundred years ago. And, I mean, we talked about it a lot with the PHs, trying to learn as much as we can. But, you know, and they explained to us in the 60s, there were not any game animals in, in South Africa. like Any, you know, any place in Southern Africa where there is not where they disallowed game hunting there is no game mm-hmm. because yeah. they are all killed because you know it's easier for them than raising cattle and stuff like that but the problem is in one generation every there's no kudu there there's yeah. no blessed buck there's no anything to eat because they just they slaughter them all and that, yeah i mean now there's value there's hundreds of millions of planes game in south africa now just yeah in, and it's really all in the last few decades and they prefer to eat goat and sheep and beef yeah. I mean, pretty much like we do and um you know for me i'd rather go over there and eat kudu and but you know no, eel. but you know even with them all the animals that i killed even for like bait and stuff for the lions they get half the animals so like if i go over there and i kill two kudu and you know a bush buck and three buffalo they get half of it the community does so you know that's what feeds them so it's yeah. a it's a, it's a it's a wonderful thing that I just wish people understood. You know, it's kind of like, you know, but it's almost like you can't until you go there though. No, like you yeah, just don't yeah, have you a con- can, or you can't yeah. get a grasp of the, I mean, it, it's because you know, we're, the, we, we get on so many animals so frequently, it sounds like they're just running around everywhere. And that is really not the right picture either. Cause you're like, you're hunting hard, but the, there is game around. And, and obviously the guys that are, are 
taking you around, know how to find you, find them and put you on right. game very frequently. But well, we I, were out there I, by I, ourselves without the pHs. We wouldn't find yeah. shit. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I, I, cause I kind of think a little differently than you guys, but I've been a bunch more. It, it, it's true, but it's not. There's only so much game there because those, these are game conservancies. And that doesn't mean there's like hyphen something. It's just like these are areas set up for people to hunt. So there is massive game, uh, game. But if we didn't have pHs, we'd just shoot young stuff, or we'd be shooting right. females. Yeah, we wouldn't know yeah. any different. So right. you, you know, because we, yeah, I mean, you think about if we went and rode around for six hours, we're, we're going to see five hundred, eight hundred animals. Yeah, yeah. And you just get spoiled by that. But it's so shocking the first time you come from America over there because there's very few places here. Where you ride around and see that kind of in you know, those many mammals, but then it's like, okay, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the most mature kudu if that's what you want to shoot, or and right. you know you can shoot a kudu every day you're there, but if you want to shoot a good, and you can even call it trophy, that's fine because that generally means a mature and that's the best one to remove from the herd, and you know that takes time to shoot the right one to find it. Yeah, and well, that's and it, all the way through all the animals. Yeah, even I mean we had extreme amount of success, and it's hard to downplay that yeah. much but we i still spent an afternoon and saw 10 animals depending on the weather yeah mm -hmm. you know you never know when you when you leave there was that night that we went out that i shouted at a blast buck but <laughs> other than that <laughs> like, it was the same night because there's nothing out yeah that we day. didn't yeah. see and we because we nothing. met up on the road and we're mm -hmm. like even guy was surprised guy and seppi both phs they were both like there's not shit out here right now yeah is it windy or something yeah it was overcast and kind of shitty and you know, windy. Just standing on the side of the road drinking beer because full, <laughs> full, yeah. full moon yeah. yeah i mean i mean again it's just like here when there's a full moon the animals can go feed at night and it was it's summer over there so it's hot during the day and if they can do that and don't have to move during the day it's good for them that was one thing that uh the when you brought the wind that we saw there was like a, sh a shift sir that was me sir um, there was like a shift halfway through the week where the first few days when we were up top going after wildebeest, like it is a chore there. It was windy. You can't get within 600 yards of them. And if you do, you try to get a shot off and then it's still windy. Who knows? And then there was one day that we went out, Tommy and I went out with Jose and it was, there was no wind and it was like a complete change. Like they weren't afraid of you. I mean, they're weary, but you're getting way closer to them. Like just the wind alone. It, it it changed everything. Uh, some of the animals, like I don't know if guys go over there and they can only shoot 200 yards and they have a list of animals they want to shoot. Some of it, I don't know how a pH gets it done. No. Uh, I mean, we put a couple stocks on, well, like my my Impala, we spot them at 600 yards and I just wasn't comfortable with it where it's we were. Small so, animal. So we, and the, like it was on the other side of a valley. So I, when as soon they disappeared as soon as we went down the hill. And the next time we saw them, we were 70 yards away. Like, that's just the way it was going to go. And we made that whole stock and got real close. But I don't think we got that close to Impala again mm -hmm. all week long. I can't think of any animal that we reasonably got up on under 100. Like, there's the, there's the moments of opportunity where it's like, yeah. oh, shit, they're right there. But <laughs> where you sneak up yeah. on them. But it yeah. is funny. Black wildebeest and blessed buck up on top of the mountains there and, and, and kind of the open area. When you get 800 yards from them, they start running. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they don't stop. And they run and run. And I've, run. Yeah, it's I've never shot a, so a blessed buck or a black wildebeest. And I probably shot, I don't know, a dozen of each maybe. Never shot one inside of like 300 yards mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, we basically... We were not really even at the end. We're almost after the season, right? So those animals have been hunted hard since yeah. March. Yeah. And as soon as they see the truck, those black wildebeests are like, uh, uh, not 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 my mountain. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not a if you're not real mobile, because you know we see a lot of older guys over there hunting and stuff. You're not real mobile. Like you're not going to be able to put a stalk on them. No, no, no. no. You about yeah. have to chase them over a hill, and then that's your next your next spot's going to be when you crest that next hill. Yeah. And it's yeah. almost like. I don't know, like Murphy's law of hunting. Like you're going to look for wildebeest and you cannot find one. And you got to like the closest we could get. I went out with Tommy and Jay to film shooting eight, six. And the closest we could get was 375 yards. And I had the 12 and a half inch barrel shooting 160 grand. And I was like a little, you know, I didn't really want to push it past 350. And then I ended up taking that shot and I hit him good. But like 
we could not get close. And then another day, I didn't even want a black wildebeest. And we drive up, and there's one sitting at a whole herd, sitting at 100 yards, staring right at us. Yeah. yeah. And they just don't move. And we stop, and they sit there for <laughs> they know five you're minutes. Hunting them. The yeah. PHs were saying, too, like the, the wildebeest, the black wildebeest specifically, they're saying they're too dumb to die. Like, <laughs> you can put a – Drew put a good shot on that wildebeest with the 8.6, and I don't know how far we went. We found it. Well, it was like, well, they went down about, I'd say, 100, 200 yards. We followed them over a hill. Then they came running right back. I thought we were going to get stampeded. Yeah. They came to like 50, realized we were there. And then I don't know how they didn't see us. And then turned and went back. So then I got another shot at 200. And I was like, am I just making terrible shots? And then it went, it left the herd, went off by itself. Uh, And it was behind a bush. And I just put one in its neck to put it down. And then we went and looked at the shots. And like, I lunged it with the first one got it in the heart with the second one i was like how the hell did yeah, this thing they're move? so those, tough. those are tough mm-hmm. animals you know and it, but it's interesting too as we're trying with eight six like um that's a 160 tsx out yeah. of a 12 inch and yeah it wasn't yeah and out of the 16 inch i've had great success with that on that size game but you know this time i was shooting a ttsx rather than a tsx and i think the tsx is probably the better bullet for the eight six um, but you know, we shot everything from eight inch barrels to 16 and, you know, and I hunt, I hunted primarily this entire hunt for a month with the 11 inch and I liked the 12 better. Um, and I liked the TSX bullet better, but it was still, you know, I mean, I was able to shoot, like I shot that lion, um, off sticks at 200 with that 11 inch barrel and that's a 550 pound cat yeah the other uh, that's what i was going to make the point is we're shooting big animals like some of those wildebeest are 600 pounds your golden was massive yeah Yeah, it was a huge animal but you know like for north american hunting oh it's yeah it's pretty perfect for shooting whitetail or Mm, i mean that 11 inch gun i had there's nothing in north america moose Mm -hmm. brown bear anything i wouldn't kill with that 11 inch gun with that barnes bullet Mm -hmm. all day long well, even so, even with that 160, like that black wildebeest you shot was a good sized bull, and you crushed it. Oh yeah, like, he was like 140 yards on this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and even that, you make a good lung shot on it. Um, we want to see everything like you know just, just fall on its face yeah, instantly, yeah, yeah. but it's gonna be dead within 10 minutes. Yeah, Especially and they also get like. John was telling me that they get like herd mentality, like the herd starts storming, it, kicking up, and yeah. their adrenaline goes on. They could already be dead, but they're still like, I gotta yeah, move. It, it's what if you sh- and you'll see over time when you shoot one that's not in a herd, it wants to just lay down somewhere behind some bushes. But yeah, it's right. I mean, anything you shoot in a herd, the herd takes off, they take off. But if you shoot it when it's alone, he, he might have staggered over, you know, twenty yards and laid down and just died. Yeah, it seemed but, like the herds will cover for an injured. And in, at least the wildebeest, if one's injured, the herds will kind of uh, surround it so you can't see it. Like yeah. it was, they do crazy stuff over it's there. It's hard to shoot stuff in a herd because mm-hmm. and if you do it with something, especially, I mean, I would never shoot uh, a cape buffalo in, in a herd because it does that. And then they're, they're mean and they'll kill you and they're protective. And then it's hard. Once it goes in the herd, you have to identify it. You know, it's like you got to look for one bleeding out of its nose or whatever. Yeah. If it's not falling down, they're like all just the standing one. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had, uh, you and Jose, I mean, Jose, if he tells the story, he'll cry. About Jose. It, but but uh, <laughs> the you had Kate Buffalo that were a little touchy, right? Oh, yeah. So we, Jose wanted, he wanted a zebra and, or a pajama donkey. And pajama donkey. <laughs> And so, like, donkey. And it's like, I mean, it's a weird enough thing to drive out somewhere and see a herd of zebra. But like, you know, we're we're stocking up on these things, trying to make a good shot. Because ho- with the gun Jose had, he wasn't real comfortable past you know four or five hundred yards. So a sixteen then, inch fix. Yeah, that yeah, he had and it, only shot. It's a hard yeah. thing to fly across the world, meet up with people you don't know, and shoot somebody else's gun at a bunch of animals. Like props to Jose for yeah, like doing what he did. But yeah, we're, uh, oh we're, wait a minute, <coughs> shout out to Jose. But we also gave him. The fix with uh, Swarovski Z8, three to twenty eight. It was a reasonable <laughs> I mean, setup, yeah. I mean, yeah. but you know, still not yeah. not being practiced or comfortable. Sure, but, but anyhow, so yeah, we're stalking these zebra, and uh, you know, when your pH says, well, we should probably stop going that way because we go that down there, the wildebeest will, or the buffalo will smell us and come down the hill and kill us. Yeah, and so it's like, <laughs> dude, wait, and I'm sitting on the truck with Desmond, and like these guys take off to stock around the oh, zebra. Yeah, yeah. Thomas and knows all about Desmond. He'll climb a tree when you get in the buffalo. And all we did was watch buffalo, and like as soon as those guys left the truck, heads come up, and the cows start 
because they had some calves with them too mm. so they were serious like you yeah. weren't there was no yeah. walking around yeah the cows even get mean yeah when they have calves yeah, yeah this, they made it like what 60 yards and said he's like back to the yeah, truck we're, we're not doing this <laughs> yeah well what um okay so now that you guys have been there wait what are my questions i have here oh did you write them big enough to see yes for your mom to see so now that you've been there and you ha- you took your setups based on stuff that I said to you. What would be your perfect setup for going back and shooting planes game, Mitch? My exact setup with a silencer. Like I'm, I was very happy. I just can't hear out of my right ear anymore. So, well, <laughs> well I don't want some workers' comp claim. All right, <laughs> we should have had you guys fill out some. Yeah. Mm. Uh, True. I would go to a sixteen just. Because carrying that thing around is fine for a day or two. But, I mean, I guess it really depends on the hunt. But I would still go to a 16. Same hunt you went on. What would you do? I would still go to a 16. Just okay. to be able to get in and out of the truck easier, carry it around. And then I do love that Voodoo, the 5 to 25. And I'm a magnification whore. But mm-hmm. I don't think I dialed over 15. Like some mm. 3 to 18. Just cut cut, yeah. cut that extra weight off the gun. Yeah. Get it small. I mean, it's short. But yeah, it's tall, you know. But like it's tall a, a smaller it's, scope. It's heavy. Just something lighter and then a kickstand because we only had so many of the prototypes there. So I was running the Atlas. And you're junior. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, um, well, with that said, it's interesting because I wanted to ask you guys this before you answer the setup question. Mm-hmm. Well, go ahead and answer the setup question. I'll ask Bigger caliber. Question. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, you had a talking point too, which I wish that we, I wish we talked about it while we were there, but here we are on a podcast where we can talk about it, but. Uh, everyone here is lucky. I think mostly because of you and the company, but like I'd say because of me, mostly because of Kevin. <laughs> but like anyone can look through the best glass on the market, basically anytime. And you were you using the Swarovski? Did you use this? No, he's using the March. I did oh, that's sh- right. I did shoot it a little bit, and then I shot that the March one to ten, and then my March three to twenty four. Right. Oh, we put the March one to ten on yeah, the eight on inch. The yeah. Eight yeah. Inch. yeah, and we talked eight, about six. how. Because you didn't dial once. You dialed a couple times, but you didn't dial once. Yep. And not having, I mean, we all shoot like BDC reticles. Um, and not having that was something that you talked about. And I don't think, based on your experiences, I don't think you would get a Swarovski. Uh, well, no, I I think, I don't know that Swarovski makes the thing that's perfect for me. Like, right. And that's just because we do so much different shooting Optics all the time. Optics are hard. You know yeah, I mean? I mean, it's hard to have one optic that'll do everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and we tried that, and I think we got close with our marches, but it's still not perfect at everything. But it's we can go to a shoot on the weekend and shoot a 1,000 yards with those scopes, right. and then we can turn around and go hunting, and they're reasonable at both. Well, yeah, because you guys, um, Mitch and Nick, have marches, but originally you had Swarovski, what, the Z6, yeah. Z6 the 2.3 to, to 15 or whatever? Yeah. We had five to thirty. So five to twenty-eight, yeah. Or what are they? Three and a half to twenty, something like that. The twenty-eight power. Five to thirty. Oh, you guys had. Oh, I thought you had the ones that I have. The my, mine never made it on my gun because it. <laughs> mine's on. Sp- mine's on my dad's gun. Yeah. <laughs> so, but so, what we were, we do a lot more prairie dog hunting, or we were up till now, than we were big game hunting. So it's if we're going to shoot the same rifles, which like we did a couple years ago, mm-hmm. that's really what we set those up to go do, and and I really love the magnification for doing doing that. Well, okay. With that said. Well, you didn't go above 15. No. I mean, to spot, I, it was nice to have. Oh, for spotting, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, if mm-hmm. you had time to get set up, because I had the uh, Bushnells, and they were 12 power, so my field of view was tiny. Your binoculars, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> and my field of view was tiny, so I was, you know, I'm trying to find things that these guys are all experienced finding, they're like, they're right there. And I'm like, yeah, it's looking all, around. So, mm-hmm. But once I got on something, you know, even John used it to, determine if we should go follow that herd if there was a bull or not because he couldn't see so we dialed the 25 on my scope get a better look at him so it was nice for that but yeah that's a good point i think every time i went over 15 power i was it was a mistake like i was unhappy like field of view or mirage no if i shot like if you shoot at much over 15 you're just lost in recoil Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. yeah. that's true it's like yeah because your field of view goes to shit what about you did you shoot over 15 or what do you think I kind of left mine around five when we're just trucking around. I shot a lot without adjusting anything. Yeah. And then it is uh, amazing when 
in your mind, if you're focused on the animal, you're on five power, how far you can shoot accurately with that. Oh yeah. And I, like I practiced at 10 cause I knew we were going to be dialed down and, but 10 is, they so say you come out of recoil, you can't find anything. I did a lot more. Yeah. Even 10 crank power. into, yeah. to find targets. But I will say like on my kudu, uh, I was dialed into 24 describing the animal to the pH cause he couldn't see it clear yeah. through the binos. Like mm-hmm. I'm like, he's got white tips and this, like yeah. he, he was making the call. Oh, he on, didn't have a spotting scope with him. Yeah, right. he was just looking through. Well, he's looking through those Zeiss, but he's a ten power, and I'm a twenty four, and I'm like, he's. I'm like, I don't know what a big kudu is, but this is how this is what <laughs> this one looks like. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I know when I went to uh, Stormberg after you guys, uh, <coughs> I put that twenty two inch barrel on my gun, and I put that uh, little Paul Mark Eight, the three and a half to twenty five or something on there. Mm-hmm. And with the 20, I, that's what I use the 25 power on. I, I don't think I shot on 25 power and, and it was hot and I had Mirage, but I would look at, you know, for that mountain reed buck I showed you guys where the horns were broken off and everything like yeah. zoomed in looking at it and picking out stuff, you know, and that was a, a, a rare instance where we had a lot of time and it bed down in front of us and was watching us and it just thought it was far enough away that it, you know, wasn't in danger, but I was able to zoom in and look at its uh, horns broken and all that stuff. But yeah, I probably shot at 12 power or something. Yeah. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm pretty sure Jose had whatever optic he was using cranked at all times mm. and would hop out of the truck and <laughs> three to 20 run to a spot and he'd be like, I can't see it. I'm like dial down, like come off magnification. Yeah. And, I, and he's yeah. also dialing in that Suero. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's, that's your option, right? right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and which uh, it's pretty convenient which is great. for yeah. hunting. Yeah. Greatest turret design, like I love that turret, yeah. Yeah, like for good. setting up a scope. It's awesome. Uh, but if you like, we did a lot more long shooting than I thought we were gonna do. Yeah, okay. and for follow ups, especially if someone's calling range for you, like mm-hmm. or if the animals are moving away and you haven't set up. Like I'm glad I wasn't dialed. You're not just constantly cranking. Yeah, you're you're, you're just adjusting in the reticle. Or you got like like my will to be we hit it at five thirty and it ran to six sixty yeah and I'm continually trying to stop it right and if I was dialed I'm now having to do like twice the math like yeah I don't know that's that's a cool thing with the Swaro is because you, you you set it up with that Z eight reticle and you have the number you know like two hundred three hundred four hundred five hundred six hundred and if it's at five seventy five you just go half and then half between the I mean yeah damn, pull the trigger. Yeah, that you know, design's really cool. Because it, it's hard when you start doing, I mean, especially for you guys being engineers, you know, when you do math, there's a number you get, and you want to be right on that. Mm-hmm. When it comes to hunting, sometimes it's like plus or minus 10%, who cares, pull the trigger. Uh, you know, it's better to be fast than to be exact. So It's a I hard thing to do, though. It, like yeah. it, is, it is hard to send a bullet yeah. when you're not 100% confident you're holdover. Yeah. Like I made my, our, our little dope bracelets like we oh. just to help. I don't know. Oh, that was cool too. Yeah, yeah, you guys made bracelets and had all your dope on there. So well, quick reference, right? Mitch did it, and then I was like, it's cool. Mitch is with me, so he'll just tell me the dope because we're shooting <laughs> yeah. the same rifle. And then and then he left, and I was like, shit. <laughs> I had to make I my own. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was something too that even some of the PHs, um, it's not that they didn't comprehend the idea of dope but they just were like no you should just know what yeah, it, like they're just all so foreign to it because as i think it's rare they shoot something over 200 yards yeah. and when i go there it was like you know we're gonna shoot stuff to 600 yards and you're like what I'm like yeah like I, i'm not that great of a shot but that's not like we have good equipment i know what i'm doing got good ammo yeah, I would much rather do that than try to stalk up to 200 yards on every animal. Like, yeah. We can do this. Part of testing the equipment, too. It was funny, though, because I think toward the end of it, once they the PHs got kind of comfortable with the distances these guys were shooting, it was almost like a they wanted to see how far that... Because like, we'd get onto something, yeah. and it would be like 5, 6, and you're like, ah, how do you feel about that? And these guys would be like, no, no. let's get a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it depends, because it, it's all... Yeah, you want to do something ethical, like you yeah. said, Mitch. But, I mean, then from a selfish perspective, you don't want to spend your whole day tracking something, crawling through the mm-hmm. briars and the snakes and the spiders. I mean, I know you and I talked about it. Like, I'm bit to shit. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, spiders and, it's, I don't know, some African chigger or something. I don't know mm-hmm. what's all over me. Pepper ticks. Uh, oh, the pepper ticks. Yeah, yeah that's what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just all over me. I probably have, like, 100 bites that are itching me right now. 
And also, even if it doesn't go that far, like the terrain sucks. Like we carried a couple. I mm. carried a couple <laughs> wildebeest yeah. out with some people, and it fucking sucked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yours wasn't yeah. too bad. It was like it was just kind of far, but yours was well, Nick's was shitty. Well, you, yeah, you, it was a plan. You think about it. It's like I had you guys bring over a sawzall for Rad. Cause, yeah. Because you know, and that's because I had to help carry some yeah Cape Buffalo out of a place, and I'm like, this is stupid. We could sawzall this thing into quarters, like cut the head off, cut it in quarters in like five minutes with a sawzall. I'm yeah. never doing this again because it's 120 degrees and it's two hours of us cutting this buffalo up to carry it out because we're yeah. in a position you couldn't. And you don't have enough guys to carry a 2,000 pound bull out of somewhere. And just yeah. like not and possible. I so I, we use the they call it a stretcher, but it's really like a, a tarp with handles on it. Yeah. yeah, and they work really good. Like your first like if you're going work, downhill, works. Yeah, <laughs> we were not. We were not. <laughs> <laughs> We were going across hill, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny because Zimpewe, our tracker, was he's like five little five, guy, yeah, little guy, <laughs> like actually five five. He's shorter than Seffy, yeah. And uh, I'm on the uphill and he's downhill, and I'm like, no, no, you and me, we trade, <laughs> yeah. And it was Guy and I, and I'm taller than Guy, but I was like, he's like the legend, so I didn't want to be like, hey, Guy, let's swap. So I just kind of like sucked it up, and then did the same thing the next day. I was on the up. I was thinking about what Nick was saying the day before as I'm helping like Mitch with his, and I'm like, I'm on the wrong. <laughs> See, I mean, that's also same way I was my first couple times over. Now that I've been through a few of those, and Rad and I speak the same language, we're like, I want to shoot that kudu. He's like, yeah, you see where it's at, don't you? Like, yep, <laughs> I do. I was like, so let's just sit here in glass for an hour and see if it moves down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see like where the road is. If down, it goes toward the road. If it goes yeah. up to the road, and if not, <laughs> let's make a mental note where he is now. Let's come back in the morning. Yeah. And let's yeah. find him near the road. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they work smarter. harder. Yeah. You know, but I mean, it's cool because they'll accommodate whatever you want to do. But for me, I'm like, ooh, how do I want to spend my time? And that's hard. Like, I've, I've, yeah. I've done that enough times where now I'm like, mm, no, let's, let's make this uh, easier. That was my favorite part about, like, the last day that everyone went hunting. Tommy and I went with you and Rad. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple where we were in – we were in Cowie, and he's like, "They're right there." And like, nah. He's like, "Let's let's go somewhere else." <laughs> I was like, "This is <laughs> awesome," because I'm like, "Fuck, that's really fucking far." I don't want to go up there. Yeah, I'd already shot a, enough things to where I'm like, "Yeah, if it makes sense, we'll we'll do it." Yeah. But if not, it, it's okay. I'll I'll be back another time. All right, so guys, I want you, you know I, I talk tons about Africa now and hunting, and I want to know how is it different than you know those expectations. First of all, I want to go with. Was it better or worse, Mitch? Better than you were expecting, <laughs> yeah. the same or worse? It, I it was way better. Like okay, just, uh, no, yeah. you way impossibly better. Same? Yeah. Okay, by better. how much, guys? Drew said impossibly. Because I feel like I'm life changingly better. Like it was just like makes me warms my heart. I don't know. It's like. I mean, we've been working in the gun industry for a, a, a while, and it's like it was the culmination. And, and you of know me a while, and I tell and you like, how great it's going to be. Yeah, it's just like how could you ever want to do anything else? Like, <laughs> you guys agree? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you could explain it any better than you did, and you're still like, yeah, that's great. Sounds like it's going to be awesome. Then you get there and you're like, I get it now. It's Kevin didn't un- it's, even tell us it was good. It's yeah. unexplainable. Like you can't. And this is my first time ever leaving the country, ever going on a big. This was a lot of firsts for me, and it was just overwhelmingly amazing every second. Just like, yeah, you get so lost in a hunt for a little bit, and you're locked in, you're zoned, and then like you lose the animal, or they run off, or whatever and then you'd like stand up and you look around and you realize where you are and you just have beautiful canvas in the background hills valleys and, I know, it, and it was then like, it hits you again and you're like it's like I'm we were in Africa. Yellowstone and Grand Canyon at the same time yeah. so even when something goes bad you just look around and you're like holy shit people would pay to come here just to like like as a park to view the place yeah and Tommy what? while we were there Tommy was like we we're just because that's another thing he gets real sentimental about it yeah but it's cool it's, it's cute uh, I like it there's a like sometimes if you're just sitting glassing like that the first morning uh, when I had my rain jacket on I was scaring everything away. Um, oh God! <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> you gotta tell the story. had the oh, noisiest yeah. shit on. I'm like trying to take it off all quiet, and you're just looking like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> but 
we <sighs> sat up there for a while and like you have there's plenty of time for you to think while you're in Africa and he and I talked at one point and he was like he's like so think of where we are and then think about when you get home where you're going and like you're gonna have to look at that for a couple of days like how do you look at anything like this is not I mean we live in an area that people take vacations to because of how beautiful it is and I look around like well it's not Africa <laughs> yeah it's true <laughs> Well, what about you? You're probably the most experienced hunting and traveling. And what'd you think? Well, and I also say like, uh, you know, Kevin gave me a trip to New Zealand a couple of years ago. So it is my second rodeo, I guess. But, and it's way, it was, I enjoyed it more uh, personally than New Zealand. Cause it's more my kind of hunting, f- yeah. you know, as far as the, but the, the versus like all the different animals everywhere. It's all free range. Like uh, it's just, it's unmatchable. I don't know where it probably just doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, I can't imagine where you get the abundance of species, natural environment, and just the uh, New Zealand is an incredibly, incredibly beautiful place. Yeah, it was amazing. But I agree. It's it's not necessarily my wasn't. I appreciate them all, and the people yeah. were great, but. I feel much more relaxed and at home in South Africa with Crusader and the beauty is equal and it's kind of more diverse, but just the, the abundance of animals and the difference of species. Um, yeah, you just can't explain it. Cause that's what I want to go out to see. Like I love it looking like the grand Canyon or looking picturesque or like a park, but I want to see a bunch of animals mm-hmm. and just having that opportunity. And for me, because that's the opportunity for me to constantly learn about the animals and the conservation and, you know, the interaction of the animals and just all the different things. Um, yeah, it, it's it's amazing. I, I, I can't believe that more Americans don't go there than do now. I think there's a lot of just the barrier of going, the travel, you know, the actual going is hard. Because yeah. when you look at what you get for your, your dollar or your experience so time... It, it's just it's unbeatable i, I mean, mean we probably had what 30 there's 30 species you can hunt there and you can do it any way yeah, you want yeah. you know yeah i mean you can yeah. hunt all week long for one thing mm-hmm. yeah. or you know for us it's all the first time so we're all just like laying waste to <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you know we're trying to get as much experience as packed into it as you can yeah so hard to explain but it's so necessary and mandatory for people to go i, I mean yeah. it it's great for everything it's great for conservation it's what's you know, providing conservation for these animals and making sure they're there for, you know, generations. Um, you know, it's feeding all these people. It's helping them out. And, and selfishly, it's fine to be selfish. But there's so many animals and so many things to see, and you can learn so much. And you just see why everyone gets inspired by going there. Like, you should go. You should go do this. Like, it's more important than a new car or having a bigger house or anything else You stupid you'd spend your money on. Like it's not that expensive, and it's not hard. I think people think like no, because they think it's, it's the hard because, because it's Africa. But in South Africa, they speak English, right? Yeah, there's direct flights. Like yeah. they take care of you when you get there. Like you book a hunt with Crusader, or there's dozens of outfitters that are great. You don't have to worry about anything. They meet you at the airport. They take care of you. They take you everywhere. They provide you with food. They do everything for you because they want you to come back. They want you to tell your friends. It's, yeah. it's like going, I mean, it's no different to me than going to like freaking Cancun or somewhere. Yeah. If you don't have to bring guns too, oh. then oh. there's no excuse to not go. Yeah. The guns are a pain in the ass and they yeah. have great guns even. So we're in the process of getting them some of our rifles. So when people mm-hmm. go, they'll have our stuff to hunt with and they want our guns to hunt with, but they have some good, uh, I think it's Alamo customs or somebody, one of the custom rifle companies here, they have those rifles. So if you want to go. And, you know, our friends Brett and Ron Dan, they went over. They didn't even take guns. They used Andrew's guns. Yeah. The and right way to do it. If I mean, we, we have our own goals, right? So we yeah. took a buttload of stuff, but it is a pain in the uh, ass. And it's just, it's a bunch of make-believe. The whole thing. Like, yeah, yeah, it's basically, ex- yeah, it's some it's level a, like extortion to yeah. get your stuff in. <laughs> yeah, so just don't take and guns. Yeah, and if, we'll if get ours there it. soon enough. We'll work with Hornady to make sure there's ammo over there. But for right now, just just give Crusader a call or send them an email. Talk to Andrew and Rad. Go shoot their guns. You know, you got pay the them for a couple boxes yeah. of ammo. Yeah, we we had them up. build a 
thousand yard range you can go shoot and their guns are nice and i mean and andrew uses swarovski optics like you're not going there using junk yeah. probably nicer than most people have mm. and you'll be able to shoot at whatever distance because i think he's got like a he got a 300 wind mag uh he's got the 375 375 mm-hmm. a 308 you know when you said caliber wise earlier so to switch gears again yeah do you want to go with a bigger caliber do you mean like 308 or you mean you want to go 300 wind mag 375 what you want to do uh well i mean i guess my my side story is i took a 375 one of my personal guns with yeah. me and i shot a couple animals with uh a gun I built some years ago uh, when I worked at Winchester. Did you and do iron sights or use the optic? I had it, it's a Model Seventy Express set up with iron sights, and mm-hmm. then I ha- I put a, a Mark Six One to Six loophole on top of it, and I shot that the nice. whole time. But that's just I'm a I'm used to shooting through a scope, so yeah. Uh, I think I shot it on one power, both. You know. Oh, nice. But like the when you see stuff fall down immediately, it's extremely satisfying yeah. after a uh, week of chasing stuff. Down. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> and I, not just like run around and fall down. I mean, fall like yeah. down, like down face in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like that's where we're going to have to get the truck to. Cause that's where he was standing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, very satisfying. And also I think I didn't expect you really started the question with expectations and I didn't expect to shoot as far as we were. And I'd like to have some more juice out there. Like I'm comfortable shooting that far. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. It's more, I'd like to be making a bigger impact out there. Yeah. You guys all shoot well, but you know, yeah, it becomes you're shooting six, five and you know, you can shoot six, five thousand yards on target. Fine. But when it comes to killing stuff, you, you know, you need, you need to be shooting two MOA and you need to be, putting it right in there if you're talking six seven hundred yards to yeah. put something down with a six and five it's like you said not wanting to chase chase animals or lose them i mean i like uh, it's I a sickening feeling to it, lose an mm-hmm. animal it I sucks shot, and it happens i shot 11 animals from the ground and that I, the one i lost i was sick about it the whole trip yeah. i dropped an impala at 400 yards and like it went down i was like oh that was a great shot I jumped back up and and took off like I'll always put another round in it. But, yeah. you know, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, you've hunted a lot, and, and I hate for you to be upset about it, but it's impossible not to be when you yeah. care because it's not like hunters, like we hate animals. Like no. we don't want to hurt them. We want to kill them. Um, we want it to be quick, the best death they can have. But it's just you hunt enough. It's impossible. Like you're going to fuck up. you got to yeah. let it go, man. I mean, and it's not even necessarily a fuck up. You think you make a great shot, and it's like, hey, there's no new no reason to shoot again and oh next thing you know it's like shakes it off jumps up and runs mm-hmm. and it's probably dead but you're never gonna find it and that sucks and yeah it's a miserable feeling but it's just gonna happen you can't let it get to you, you just move on but yeah y- you want the best tool for the job and yeah like, yeah same you know, like mitch large bodied animals like what are out there like you realize you might want a magnum you know yeah, mm-hmm. like it, same. Like I shot eight animals from the ground. Six of them were one shot kills, and it's the other two that I worried about the whole time. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. What? Um. How important was the folding stock? You think? It's huge. Yeah. You were you carried you slung yours around most of the time folded, mm-hmm. and then yeah, you could just flip it out. Almost always. Yeah. Yeah. It's like so, the difference so. between having to like, I mean, just walking under brush. Like you can just. It's like you don't have a gun on you. You just it's strapped so tight yeah. to your chest. You just crawl under stuff and don't worry about it. So you're glad that we made you put a folding stock on the fix now? Yeah, I'm okay with it. I, uh, <laughs> 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 now, I'll, I'll even go a little further. Like the way the sling setup works with the fix is so nice because we were, we practiced a lot uh, shooting off tripod slung and trying to get like locked in as well as we could. And we didn't end up doing that much tripod shooting, but we that's what we were preparing for yeah yeah and you know a sling is important for shooting well too so the way it works on that folding stock just being able to go from this is a comfortable length to the right length to shoot without any adjustment is pretty awesome that's awesome mm-hmm. yeah see i usually carry mine extended mm-hmm. oh really but yeah but with the 22 inch barrel i was like oh with 16 inch it's not that big a deal to me i'll just you know i can hold it and do whatever yeah um then i can just shoulder it and fire quick yeah. but with that 22 inch barrel i was like oh and the whole time I was like, I need to set this up to have the stock folded when I'm carrying it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was one cool thing about Jared going with us. I mean, he's so proficient in shooting long range, but watching him use his tripod and that game changer bag 
to where I always want to like lock my gun in the tripod and you know it takes a long time he sets that tripod up throws that bag on it he's on there and shoots quick and so I can't wait at our new range we're building here Mm -hmm. be done next week for me like that's a week of practice for me I'm going to use that bag on a tripod and just get used to to doing that and those shooting positions and being faster with that shooting off the tripod that way um you know because it was the same for me once he was showing me his techniques for using bags and stuff like that. And he's just, and I can do it, but he's so much more advanced than me. And so just like anything else, like I want to learn from somebody else who's already gone through the pains of doing it. Like, Hey, you're good at this. Let me just learn from you and trust you with this. Um, but shooting off the hood of the truck. So I started doing that with bags, like in the Stormberg in my last few days of hunting and was able to make long shots quickly off the hood of the truck, stopping, and some people don't want to hunt that way, and that's fine. I'm open to all types of hunting. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, hey, there's this, you know, like whatever it is. There's a blessed buck that we saw that had broken its leg and was hobbling around and was starving. It was like, oh, my God, that's 500 yards. And it's like, throw the bag up there, get on it, pew, pop, you know, and two seconds, the thing was dead. That mm-hmm. place will also, I think, change. Your, like you just said, some people don't want to hunt that way, whatever. Go there and do it and experience all the things that we experience as far as um, positions that you have to engage in or how the animal reacts or whatever. And I think that people will change their mind. Like you do three hard days of up and down and this and that. You and you'll go. So oh, cute. You'll three go, days. Hey, well, I, I just mean like it doesn't even take that like take that long for you to realize, oh, you know what? I will shoot it off the, the hood of the truck because this is going to be the most efficient way for me to do this or whatever. Like I think people's minds will change. They may go into it all purist or whatever. Um, be like, no, I have to go prone. I have to do this. And then I think kind of the, the, for lack of a better term, like the hardships of it, I think will change people's opinions. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a place for all of it. You know, it, it's like I posted something today about conservation and like my views of it. And it's, it's like me getting old and sentimental probably. But my, as I continue to learn and understand conservation and the importance of it, it's like when we shot this eel and it had like this giant mass on its front shoulder and, and you could tell it's painful for it to walk. Its hips were starting to get exposed. It's starving. And it's like that thing's either going to starve to death or it's going to get eaten by predators. And this is the best death for it. And, um, the, you know, and that, that shot was a similar way. Like it was in a weird position. I threw a bag on a rock and I had to be in an awkward position and shoot it. And, you know, it, it was what it was, but so many shots that I took half my shots. And, and so, and, and maybe because I've been so many times now more relaxed, I'm not, it kind of is what it is. Like, I know I'm going to have opportunity. I know that I, I don't care about shooting the biggest stuff. I don't, you know, for me, I'm looking for old stuff or things that need to be shot or, you know, something that's challenging. And so I had a lot more shots where I had time to set up than in the past, but also like I had a lot of awkward shooting positions still because there were things like a sin buck I wanted to shoot. And I, I I wasn't going to shoot like a small one. And, uh, it's a very small animal that's very skittish and it runs and hides and uh, you know, the things the size of like a big chihuahua. And so I shot one at 200, which isn't far, but with my 16 inch gun and, um, you know, I was set up and I was basically straddling this rock, like bent over it, had a bag up, had the, had it on it and felt 100% confident. And Rad was like, that is a hard shot. Do you not want to wait? And I was like, last time we waited, the thing ran 300 yards. Like I'm on its vitals. I'll shoot it right now. And he's like, okay. And bam, you know, it was dead. Um, but you got to practice those awkward shooting positions. Be comfortable with your optic and your setup. Yeah, I tried to get Jane as many uh, new and exotic positions as possible throughout the trip. <laughs> yeah. Jose beat you too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Including uh, spread eagle over a rock that one time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're resting on his butt cheeks and stuff. <laughs> yeah. How great was Jose coming? Jose Anote. How great is he? The best. He's, I don't. It was. Uh, yeah. It was interesting, for sure. <laughs> I saw way, more, I, way, I saw way more of his ass than I did. Yeah, I, there's not any part of his ass I didn't see. 
And I, and I tried to get him back one day. I saw him in the room. I'm walking by to go <laughs> grab a shower, and I just see Jose. So I, like, go behind the curtain. I pull my ass out, and I, like, scooch over on the glass. <laughs> and I turn around and look, Ugh. and it's Mitch and Nick. All three of them are in their underwear, but it's just Mitch and Nick like right there that are the ones that saw it. And it's like, oh, no, friendly fire, friendly fire. I was trying to get Jose. He's the only one who didn't see my ass. Uh, it was like lunchtime. Like we'd <laughs> <laughs> You guys are gross. The whole like Jose it, showed up time, huh? the day before we left. I went and picked him up from the airport. And I figured like, you know, we're going to spend 10 so, days. Well, for those time. listening, Jose, um, years ago when I owned Advanced Armament, Jose, uh, his first real job as an adult was working for me at Advanced Army. He's worked in the gun industry ever since, and he has the best attitude. It's the greatest time. I love him. And, and so he's such a fucking scaredy cat. Two, He's flown three times in his life. One time was up here to see us. I made him fly. The second time, <laughs> the other time was to Africa to go with us. But I knew he would never go over there and experience this, and I knew he would add to our trip. And, you know, I think it's part of me, like, being so fortunate. Like, I, I want, you know, my buddies like Jose that would never do this on their own. I want to push them outside their comfort zone, make them come with us and experience this. So that's who he is. I was already in Africa, so he flies up here to fly with you guys. You pick him up yeah, in the airport. Never had met the guy, and I pick him up from the airport. And fast forward eight hours after many Mai Tais. And <laughs> we like took he's him to- sleeping on my couch. We got our arms around each other. <laughs> it, like, it just was a great a great trip and he's a great you know he'll yeah, be a great awesome. friend for it, forever yeah i mean right yeah. i mean you all have a, a new <laughs> friend forever and so does he with e- each of you he's just like he makes every situation better yeah even when it's so funny that he's so fun and funny but he is terrified all the time shit yeah. in his pants <laughs> scared dude that yeah helicopter ride was he was, <laughs> he was not keen on that well okay <laughs> until he was though yeah. so to set this up um uh, about a week or two before we went to Africa, or before you guys went, um, Andrew at Crusader. It's it's the end of the season, and they have um, they also raise cattle and sheep, and they have an area that the blessed buck and the black wildebeest have gotten into, and it's their prime grazing area for the cattle and the sheep and the blessed buck and and, uh, the black wildebeest are kind of uh picky grazers and they've gotten into this good area and they want them all out of there and so that was part and and a lot of people don't care about shooting those and so the they're also you know very good at breeding yeah they breed year year round yeah and 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 so they wanted a lot of those cold and they asked me, hey, would you, we'll get a helicopter in here if you'd like to breed those. And originally they're like, hey, yeah, they are, <laughs> breed them. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's more Jose and I'm bringing yeah. him. He'll breed everything. From a helicopter, yeah. that's yeah. some accuracy. <laughs> well, you know. I didn't get to breed it. It's, it's, you know, genetics <laughs> and stamina. <Empty> bags. <laughs> <laughs> totally empty bag. It had been like a week and a half. <laughs> no, so if we want to call these things. Yeah, for me it had been like. Three and a half yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Just you there. and Rad. <laughs> no, and Empty yeah, bags every night. Can't get a girl, get a cute <laughs> boy. <laughs> so anyway, they're like, if you want to call some of these things, we're going to helicopter here and you go up and do it. And they like did it and they paid for it for two hours for me to go up. And I'm like, dude, that didn't last. I can't be a, like, I'm not an asshole as much as I like to play. It's like the homies are going to be over there. It's like, how about I pay for another two or three hours? Is he willing to stay? And everybody goes for a half hour. And that's what we set up. So, had I known how incredible it was, it would have been. Fuck you guys! You would not have gone. <laughs> I would have shot every animal. And and so at Andrew's place, um, the helicopter lands in his yard, takes you up like six thousand feet, top of these mountains, and that's where this prime grazing is. And we got after the blessed buck and the black wildebeest and so we're doing it with the fixed rifle so it's with the bolt action so it's already hard like i had eight six you guys use six five eight six and two two three we yeah. had the mini fix used, mitch yeah, did mitch's two two three did anybody shoot six five mm-hmm. no, no i think no. we, we all, all shot it was all eight six and yeah. two two three okay yeah jose and i shot two two three. so i i went up for probably 20 minutes i shot i think a dozen animals um but it was cool too because in Texas, when you go on the pig hunts, and I have been, it's like this table. It's all flat. It's super easy. You get real close. But up there, you're at altitude, so that's harder for the helicopter to fly. And then you're on the mountain. 
So the maneuvering is more difficult. Because I had some shots that were 100 yards. Because I only yeah, use yeah. one power with a dot. Mm-hmm. I had my 11-inch 8.6, and um, I was getting after it. So, man, that was fun. But everybody got to go. Mm-hmm. And that that was awesome for me, even though, like, after I went, I was like, the guy was like, hey, why don't we just land and get more ammo for you? And I was like, no, nah, I ain't going to do that, man. I said, if there's time at the end, I'll go again. It's like, oh, okay, but I want to show you this other thing and blah, 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 and all this. They were trying to cater to me because I was, you know, writing the checks. But I was like, ah, let them go. It's fine. And then the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, fuck these guys. <laughs> I want to go. But then Jose... <laughs> Because he was so scared and was making oh, him yeah. go. He wouldn't go till the end, so I'm hanging out with him. So then I just got really into, oh, my God, Jose. Like, it's fun, but it's scary because he's <laughs> terrified of everything. And I was like, I don't even know if the seatbelt is just like this lap thing. I don't even know if it really works in all this. But um, it wasn't a it was lot. Fun. He was like, yeah, just put it on. You won't fall out. Okay. Yeah, yeah the instructions <laughs> from yeah. the pilot were my favorite. He's like, have yeah, you, I heard have you were very scared. I checked the seatbelt five times. I was like. <laughs> But, but I didn't know, the I didn't know like, none of you have been in a helicopter yeah, before. Never. The yeah. pilot, though, he's like, have you shot out of a helicopter before? And I was like, no. And he's like, okay, don't shoot the rotor. Don't shoot the landing gear. Okay, let's go. No, yeah, yeah, he does not. He was a man of few words. Like, go. I was expecting. Yeah, well, if you wait for him to say, okay, shoot that, then it's yeah. cool. Well, that's what I was expecting more of. And he, I think he asked everyone the same question. He's like, have you ever shot a helicopter before? And I was like, not at anything and alive. I'm like, it's in my blood. No, but I was like, not at anything alive. And he's like, but you have? I said, yep. And then I didn't hear another word from yeah. him, like the entire flight. I was expecting him to be like, hey, that one or whatever. But he was a soft spoken guy. Yes, he I was. liked it. I didn't want to hear a lot oh, from yeah. him. Yeah, no, he's, mm. He can fly. I, too. I got a couple. Oh, yeah, he good can fly. Like, <laughs> or yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It was. Uh, well, missed you know, again. you'd be falling in the herd and then you hit. And there was one because I was shooting all wildebeest. The herd we found it was wildebeest, so they would not go down. So like well, you got to shoot him, Drew. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I was, and I was like, "Am I missing?" And he's, you know, he's flying the helicopter, fucking sideways, following the shit, and he's watching them better than I am. And he's like, "No, you're hitting it. Just keep going." And yeah. then, like, you get one in the neck, and then you could tell he'd just like be like, "Good shot, peel out." To yeah. that point, I used Mitch's uh, two two three, the mini fix, the mini two two three, twelve inch mm-hmm. barrel. Yes, and I have a completely like new uh, pair of respect pants. pair of pants <laughs> and respect for five five six because we were <laughs> shooting fifty five grain. I mean those it was those spire points. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm sure those have been used forever, but shooting Wildebeest who this entire week I'd seen like they can take whatever. That's I mean, a tough you, animal. You get that top down shot on them and they crumble with it. And yeah, it I think incredible. from right behind the shoulders forward, you get it on top of the spine, it, it's it's lights out. Central nervous system is done. Yeah. Yeah. Five five six, the Barnes bullet or that horny bullet, like you can you can lay shit out with it. I love mm-hmm. that Barnes fifty five grain or their yeah, sixty two or whatever. I've killed some big animals with that. It's good. It's a good bullet. You know, and again, it's like shot placement. You shoot it in the ass. Mm. You know, you got to follow it up with a good shot. Yeah. So, what, but wasn't it so cool? We start in the yard and we go up the mountains, you know, thousands of feet, and we start from there, and you're going all around. And Thomas, this lucky son of a bitch, he got to go on just about every one of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everyone, favorite animal to hunt in Africa right now? Like after what you saw, what was your favorite? Uh, it's kudu for me. It's well, just a. Uh, well, wonderful it's a beautiful animal they live in the in the dark thick stuff up high it's kind of like comparable to elk hunting a little bit you know yeah, as far as where they so. like to live uh, size wise too uh, hard to spot until you spot one and they're suddenly like 30 yeah um and you know the thing we didn't see for four days the so it was like host. it was like the big yeah, the yeah you got to go to the areas where they are yeah, yeah. well, well, well with that said tell us Give us a lowdown of your hunt and your shot. Uh, yeah, my kudu. We were probably what, this is like day four, I think. Yeah, and that was my camera crew day, so I had I had Tommy and Jay with me. And all three of you shot. Well, sidebar, same day, same all day. three. Yeah, yeah. and then unbelievable. Night, and the night before, Jose shot one. So within twenty four hours, yeah. four got shot. Four kudu, yeah. all had, monsters. None of us amazing. know that, of course. Right. right. I think I might have heard that you had one, but I don't. It didn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the story starts great because we're gonna go up and look for kudu and. And uh, Tommy totally spots the crap out of a rock. Rock buck. And <laughs> <laughs> like guys like, you know, going around the steep corner with the truck 
And Tommy's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he has to stop. Yeah, and you can tell pissed. he was super yeah. not happy yeah, about he it. Pissed. He has to like back down the hill so he could get a look at this rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was pissed. He's like, I can't stop here. Yeah. And guy's like, hey, I won't, I won't fly a drone. You don't say shit about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we like go up. We make a couple more. As you're kind of zigzagging yeah, up the mountain. Yeah, going up the mountain. And uh, Tommy's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Again? <laughs> yeah, and everyone's like, yeah. nah, nah. <laughs> that guy was like, are you fucking kidding me? No, but he legit like spotted the kudu. They were down on the bottom. Oh. So like he re- he totally redeemed himself. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were on the other side of the valley. There were actually, there were a bunch because I saw yeah. a different, we were a different group a different of kudu. One. And because there were some that were like 450. And I was like, there's nothing. Like what I'm looking at is like 800 yards away. Yeah. And then they like ran up in this deep, thick draw and start. Yeah. They start going up the hill. That's where they live, and in, in the draws and that thick stuff. Yeah, we saw at least one. I don't think the one I shot was actually in that group. No, I don't either. Um, but we there was a good bull with that group of cows. So we actually turned around and went like made a play, drove past them, and then walked backwards and had to go up over hill and set up where we could see. This yeah, this up. this was more difficult than when I've been in the past because I've I've been during the rut like when they're breeding and yeah. it's easier hunting because you know we spot the cows a lot but you don't spot a lot of bulls no. mm-hmm. and they're separate most of the time unless they're trying to breed but um the last time i was over it was the rut and you know the bulls are on the cows non-stop so they're stupid and, and we were able to spot them easier yeah yeah and part of the i think before we ended up doing what we were doing um the first like iteration of the plan was gonna be to keep driving on that road and try to come up and down on them right and then some peeway was like no what if we just drive by and then we'll walk up that mountain and that's what we did we were gonna drive like all the way around and then yeah we 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 conferred and we made a a cool plan yeah but yeah we basically were like just drive past them and then then we went a couple hundred yards past and then jumped out and then came back and kind of side hilled across to get the wind in our favor yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because we were kind of on one mountain. Yeah, and then there was a bit of a valley, and they were on the other. And mountain. it's cool because we got sweet footage of all of it. So yeah. we got we got set up. Well, we spotted. Uh, it ended up being a bull off by himself, like kind of in a different section, but nice. we spotted from there. So well, that's great too, because then you have one set of eyes to worry about and one yeah. nose mm-hmm. instead of having like eight or ten. He had no idea we were there. Um, took a while for me to spot him. Guy spotted him through the binos. Uh, guy was our PH. He's got so. 30 years experience doing he, it. So. Yeah. yeah. And he was like in a little group of brush, like just sticking out of a, there was just yeah, a, it was one a little, little hole. kudu sized hole. Yeah. That's and the way it goes. Remember Thomas, my last one is just his head was poking out of the bushes. And it's like, oh, there it is. I was like, what? Oh shit. Yeah. So it was, he had to talk me in. I got set up prone, which was great. Oh, you got to shoot it prone. Yeah. 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 550 yards. So we, fi- he had a, there was a, quite a lot of talking going on. Plus, we we're trying to get the camera set up, yeah, uh, which we didn't really think we succeeded no. at the time. That's no. a poke, so man. Five fifty con- is and, and no joke with any gun. And you know, guys giving me total joke coordinates. Like, there's a rock, and to <laughs> yeah. the left of that, there's three rocks in a line, but they were definitely in a triangle. And so I'm like, I don't, I don't see what you're seeing. We yeah. finally like, all right, I see the kudu, and then he couldn't really get a good call on it. We were kind of looking into the sun. And so oh, that's when I said call, I, meaning whether or not it was a yeah, big good one. Right. Yeah. So he's just using binos. It doesn't have a spotting scope with him. Yep. And in, in fact, since we were just he and I, I loaned him the Zeiss range finding binos. He was ranging for me also. Yeah. Oh, good. So because yeah, I was like, here, you just do it. We should take him that Leopold spotting scope back and give it to him when we go back. Yeah. He he's uh, I mean, he's obviously amazing at everything. But yeah, he. Uh, so he spots him and talks us in and. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. I actually had a, like time to make a good setup. Um, got my bipod like tucked back into me and like real solid. Yeah, it's so nice when you have that time to get set up prone and you yeah. can take a couple minutes to get set up comfortable and you just feel so much better about the shot. And he didn't know we were there. So he was yeah. just kind of sitting there in his little hidey hole looking out and he didn't know you know that we had come up over the hill so i'm sure he saw us go by before yeah. he was just kind of there having a you know chilling. you stop the vehicle it's a whole nother game you yeah. keep rolling mm-hmm. it's fine so yeah we basically it was pretty far uphill shot so i knew my dope but i knew i was going to be a tad high do a little quick little adjustment in your head um and I actually dialed out because I he was in a bunch of brush and I totally expected to have to shoot again. Like they just don't yeah. fall down that far away. 
So I took, uh, he was like, you ready to shoot? And I'm like, I'm gonna, he's like, tell me when you're going to shoot. And I'm like, going to shoot like right then. So I um, pulled the trigger. I heard it hit. Guy didn't because of the freaking muzzle blast off of that yeah. break. I heard it hit. Um, and then Jay You're didn't. wearing ear pro? I would just like loose stuff in ear plugs just to keep, just to save myself. Yeah. And I just kind of kept hanging them, just kind of going driving around like that. Yeah. But, it does suck because, you know, the pH is always whispering at you and you're trying to hear what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, I mean, my last couple few hunts have been miserable, but this time, you know, I'd purchased those Norwegian silencers and had them delivered. So I was hunting with silencers. That was so much better, so much better for everyone. The animals, because you're less likely to wound them because you can communicate. Oh, better. So I, ca- I actually was solid enough. I came out of recoil and saw him go down. Or I saw him drop out of out of my scope. Oh so yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great because I was able to like call a hit, like like I saw him drop. Yeah, because that was kind of the confusing part because yeah. guy couldn't find him when he yep. went down. You saw him go down. Some people saw him go down. The whole time, I didn't even know I had him in frame. Like I went to the last because I was. That's one of those points where I was like, F- he needs to take the shot. Like I don't know if I have him, but I'm not going to be like, hey, I don't have him. Um, so I just asked the tracker some people. I was like where's the last place you saw him and he kind of same thing he's like those rocks those bushes that hole and i just put the frame on it hoping for the yeah. best and and we got that it was it well what power were you on when you shot do you know i don't know exactly but like my that that scope seems to treat me real like that shot was probably around 15 yeah i mean i did zoom yeah, in but I, I'm not I all think the way like in. i mean for the most part i mean it is nice to be able to dial up if you're inspecting something but just shooting wise, like I can't see having more than a 15 power scope being real beneficial there. Well, I mean, and this is where you can shoot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards. I remember yeah. seeing you come back down. So I remember. Well, yeah, because I had him all the way at 24 when I was describing what he looked like. And yeah. then we kind of made the agreement he was a shooter. And then I dialed back down because I expected yeah. to have to shoot again. Yeah. So so and then what uh, happens? You, you shoot, you see him fall. Nobody else does. What happens? He drops. And then, you know, uh, even heart shot, they'll run and run and run right. and run. So Sometimes. He kind of just disappeared into all this brush. So, you know, PH guy just had me stay on him. So I just sat on the scope on that spot and then, like, zoomed out so I could watch kind of the general area, mm-hmm. waiting for him to come out, expecting him to come out for, what, 10 half. minutes? Well, I was almost, by the time we got up to move, it was about a half hour. Yeah, I mean, oh. so we finally got jay up on the camera so that i could rest my eyes but i just stayed on the spot and we just waited and waited and waited and then finally he never came out so we sent the tracker up the hill and then had the bright idea to send the drone up Mm -hmm. up the mountain to look for it which was awesome because we ended up finding it in the drone oh for real yeah yeah but it's crazy too because it was it was no tommy flew that one yeah yeah. Uh, (laughs) i did some i did some good drone work before but i I didn't get hit in the head at all so yeah on that that one um no but it's it's (laughs) how's that eyebrow doing it's healed up nicely (laughs) nice um it's crazy though because by the time so guy sent some people out and he had to go down a mountain across a little valley and up a mountain they can do it faster and we can by the time the optic. drone got there tommy's like i see some peeway like he was <laughs> he already beat the drone it's so yeah. fast yeah. Yeah. yeah he hadn't quite found the kudu yet no, i don't not think yet. but he beat the drone there yeah <laughs> but it's sweet because like tommy dropped the drone right down he's upside down on a rock like yeah. he kind of rolled he probably uh, ran well, down when you find him upside down they're dead he went like <laughs> 20 30 yards downhill down, and yeah. then flipped upside down he's in this rock all yeah. it's sweet footage like oh i can't I'm sure wait i've not even now. seen it yeah so <laughs> i can't wait to see it uh but also Hopefully we had I'll time get to see it because uh because jay had it all on camera we were able to look at the shot while we were waiting like yeah and so we could hear the impact oh and then when you, uh, yeah that yeah. that helps you to relax in too video, when you get to see the yeah. shot and you see oh i hit him where his heart and lungs are yeah okay, i forgot yeah, about that because be once we were waiting i was like i'm gonna review it and see because then once once it was all done, you were like, you'd see that hole. He was standing in that hole. And I was like, fuck, let's review it and see if I can find it. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up, I saw, I'm like, oh shit, we got it all. And I could, I could say like, it was easy to see he hit and he went down in the direction. Then you can't see him in the bush. And that was exactly where we found yeah. it. Well, yeah, and if you can see where impact is, it's so nice. Did, did you guys recover the bullet? No, because we, we, that's a big freaking animal and we didn't take them all the way didn't down. Didn't have the yeah. little metal detectors. We, no. we did a took. tissue paper trail. Toilet uh, paper actually, trail. No, he w- he was through and through anyway, but yeah, yeah it was, it was, oh, you uh, wouldn't have found it. 
Yeah, right. It was through the heart five, at 550. It was pr- like legit probably the best shot I've ever taken. Yeah, it was perfect. It was a rough, it was a hard shot. And That's cool. Very, very proud of it. Because I think yeah. my hardest shot, my best shot I've ever made was this hunt too. Yeah, I was at 440 on a, a mountain reed buck. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you you poke it through the heart, it's going to die. That, that's, yeah. that's awesome. So, I mean, you didn't even need a bullet that expands. But that bullet, 16 inch, that bullet probably expanded and probably did damage. I mean, I, I think you got till 600 or so with that bullet out of the 16 inch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome. Probably yeah. a little further. I mean, I mean, how, how great is that, though? Like that hunt, you kill a, a great kudu. But even if you had shot at it, if it had been an easy shot at 200, like that's what you want. But in the end, if it all works out, what you got is so much better. Because yeah, it's I'm, like 550 in the brush. Perfect. You got a hole to poke it through. Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, that's why I hunt, man. It was very satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's awesome, man. Congratulations. I can't wait to see everybody's kudos. I mean, you, you guys all know. I mean, before you went, I was like, I don't care what you guys do. I'll pay for this much stuff. I want you each to shoot a kudu. Because, I mean, to me, it's like my favorite animal, and it's the thing you guys should all shoot. And it's not an easy hunt. So I was worried it wasn't going to happen. There were a couple of days where I was like, I don't know if everyone's going to get one. I don't, yeah. I think we might have seen five kudu in the three days previous. I right. mean, I, I put it on the uh, on Andrew and on, on the PHs. I'm like, I want my guys, if they want to shoot them, this is a priority for me, and I expect you guys to get it done. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. everybody well, was like, I mean, and you guys know. I mean, Jose shot one that night, then you guys shoot him the next day. It yeah. was so much more relaxed after, that, which worked out great because then we got to do the helicopter, all the stuff. But those guys were sweating. You know, they don't they want to make me happy. Like you know, I'm going over there a ton. I'm spending money. I'm taking a lot of people over there. And you no, know, but to me, I know it's like wild animals. If you guys can't get it done, ain't no hard feelings. Mm-hmm. But it's like well, we can get my boys kudos. We drank some beer that night. Yeah, we did. We, that was, <laughs> yeah. a, that was, a, that was like the, you guys like, did. I went to bed like eight hours before that shit. I think that everyone like just the, took a huge sigh of relief. We yeah. were all like pretty relaxed at that point. Like oh, the stress was off. Was that right about the kudu or what? Though? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, 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 Drew, what was your favorite hunt, man? Uh, I would still say, yeah, I would say my kudu, but not what? so much just the kudu, like the whole day. Well, what was it? Um, Give us a synopsis. Me and Jose went out to Cowie. Jose had gotten My favorite his, day would have been with Jose, too. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> uh, so we went out to Cowie, which is, you know, this... Yeah, another property they hunt that yeah, they lease from a friend of Andrew's. It's a totally like a microclimate and more of a super very thick, thick cool environment in the mountains. Yeah, they're explaining yeah. it's closer to the water, so they get more moisture in there, so there's a lot more vegetation, so it's just... It's kind hard. Of, it's, it's, it's hard it's a to different hunt environment. There. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to hunt and spot stuff. Um, so me and Jose went in the morning. Mm. Sorry for anybody listening. the The video that Thomas took and posted of me shooting my bush buck. That's the Cowie. Mm. That's the place. Like it's hectic because it's thick mm. and it's difficult, and there's tons of elevation and tons of brush. Yeah, there's yeah. so much different terrain. You go around a corner, and it's completely different than what you just drove over. Yeah. So we were out with John, and uh, because there were so many of us, they didn't have enough trackers. So John went with uh, a guy named Mabuti, mm, and he a he was a farmhand. So he wasn't a tracker, so he wasn't you know didn't have the eye. He wouldn't come with us off the truck. So John was kind of like alone that day. And in the mo- in the morning, we looked for kudu because they don't like the sun, and it was a hot day. So you you have like time frames. You have like kudu o'clock, which is like in the morning before the sun comes out, and then right before it gets dark. So we go out and we looked for kudu. We didn't really see it. We saw a couple um, cows, but no bulls. So then we got into Impala time and we were hunting all day for Jose's Impala. We stocked one through some bush and he missed a shot. It happens, but we went and looked for that for a while. Then we go off and we find a big herd that's divided, I guess, into three smaller, but they were joined and then not joined. And him and jose and john go off down a road to go follow him and i don't want to go with them because they're easily spooked and but i wanted to help so i didn't want to go with them make more noise and be a bigger mass so i went off on my own different thing because i knew where the herd was going so it felt really good Uh, like after being there for four or five days that i could kind of start to pick up like things pick up their patterns and 
started doing stuff. So I was spotting from the other side because we would have lost him because they walked back. John couldn't see anything. And then they thought they lost him over the hill. And then they had just started peeking back up over. And I like, because they were about to walk out into the open to go back to the truck. So I yelled at him to get down. And then that was the herd we ended up stalking where Jose got his. So that nice. felt good, but that took all day. And we yeah. were exhausted because we were on our feet most of the day. Yeah, like, it's we mountainous barely. there. It's tough. So I was like, well, no kudu today, but at least like Jose got him his Paula. I was pumped for him. Like, yeah, it was good. And we're driving back and he's like, well, it's like kudu o'clock, but we do have to get out of here soon with the daybreak. So we'll like drive down and see what we see. And he's saying this while we're like, we stopped to have a beer and a smoke. And he's saying that and he like looks up and glasses the hill and he's <coughs> like, oh, there's two bull up there. Like <laughs> it's perfect. So between that, we drive down. <laughs> if it's down. not dark, there's always a chance. Yeah. So it, it, it just happened to work out perfectly that. He was like, we'll see what we see on the way back to the gate, and then we'll go. So we saw it, and my adrenaline was instantly fired up as soon as I yeah, saw yeah, it. Yeah, sure. So we go up, we drive around, we park, and, like, there was this big field with, like, 10 bushes, and he's way up on a hill, like, can, has a huge vantage point. So we're at, like, 850 yards, and he was asking what I wanted to get to. I was like, with that crazy elevation, like, I, I think it was, like, 24 degrees. Oh, 30 degrees. Like it was up there. Yeah, that's legit. So I was like, I'm not used to shooting elevation like that. 80, or, 80 or, yards. Would be <laughs> yeah. But so I was like, I was 22 like 22 yards. We were at 800, 850. I was like inside 400 at least. But that's what I would want. Yeah. yeah. So then so. And we're in an open field. So he was just waiting until they like went to a bush to, and they were feeding and really content, which was good. We yeah. just didn't want to spook them. So we're basically squat walking. So so you're at eight what? Eight fifty. Yeah, that's long. So we're squat walking just through this giant open field with like a couple of bushes. So we're like squat sprinting, like heels hitting my ass, like run into one bush. Watch. Okay, they're feeding again, run to another. And I was exhausted. And we finally get to this big bush or but he wanted to go a little further and he's like, All right, like we can take a second, catch your breath. I was like, Oh, thank God. Then 10 seconds, he's like, like I got to stop smoking yeah. and eating carbs. It was like 10 seconds. He was like, all right, you ready? I'm like, no. <laughs> he's a machine. I, was yeah, like, yeah, John, I guess. John's 5'6", weighs 135. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And was, but so we get up there and we go up to this fence line and we can't cross it because it would just make too much noise. There was no coverage or anything. So we lay down right next to the fence line. I got my bipod all the way extended up and I lay down and I'm like looking at it and I'm just out of breath dying because we just squat we're at 290 now so and you just duck walked, walked. <laughs> duck walked 600 <laughs> yards <laughs> and that sounds horrible and I, my legs were on fire i laid out flat and i like get down and then uh i'm trying to get my setup comfortable because i don't know when this thing's coming out and i'm like floating in the air because my bipod's so high up and john's like you want this and i just look over and he just slides this big fat cow patty towards me <laughs> and i was like oh fuck yeah and i take it i just like tuck it under my stomach you have that picture don't you we should yeah. post yeah, it yeah, now yeah, yeah. yeah and then um and then i got like my bag even this is hunting up. man yeah. this is why it's so great luckily it was dry but even if it was wet like <laughs> yeah I when you're been, that exhausted you I, don't i would have just been like i'll just put we have laundry service yeah yeah <laughs> but and then my bag wasn't tall enough, so I took another, like, two cow patties and stacked them up and was, like, squishing them down <laughs> to get my bag up so I could get the height. That's so scary. then I finally find it. I get on. Um, I dialed because there was so much. I was so excited. I was like, I don't yeah. want to fuck up and forget to dial. So I dialed because they were very st stationary just in this one yeah, small yeah, yeah. area. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, all right, I think they're, like, feeding for a bit so you can relax. And I was like, oh, thank God. I put my head down for probably, like, three minutes just laying in my lap doing, like, breathing exercises, <laughs> trying to slow my heart rate. Because <laughs> I was so exhausted from, like... He's like, all right, French fry, you ready? <laughs> it's like going get, from zero, act, zero physical activity <laughs> at all, except for hockey once a week, to... You're going into labor. Duck walk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The duck walking, six hundred yards. I need a Boosh. cigarette. Help me. Catch <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, so I lay down, and then from there it, it was kind of like not that eventful, I guess. He just we just waited for the shot, and he came out at the right time, stood there perfectly broadside, and I got him good. I was dialed in too far because I was kind of nervous. So I lost him in recoil. I dialed out immediately. Oh, you mean power wise, Man, you yeah. were dialed in too oh, far? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it was just. I don't know. I was probably on 15, but it was way too much. 
Um, yeah, but it was getting yeah. a little dark. To something, tin power. That's where like having that Swarovski or something like that crystal clear glass would have made such a big difference for that. But I dialed in a little more and it was fine. But I lost them instantly. Dialed out, um, reloaded, and it John. Happens. And I mean, that's yeah, just hunting. And he didn't go far because, as it turned out, I dub- double lunged him. Mm-hmm. It was a perfect shot. But did you make a second shot? Yeah, just insurance shot because. Yeah, I don't blame he, you. Yeah, he walked mm. down. I they, lost. They him. can cover ground. John walked me back into him, and he was like, "You see those two trees, and how there's like that little hole in the middle." And he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "His body's about to come up in that hole. If you see it, hit it." And I was like, I don't see. And then I just see like stripes slowly Massive. pass by. And I put another one and he dropped mm. right there. That's and then, great, man. And then they went back to the truck. And you laid there and cried? Yeah. <laughs> he was a monster. For a couple <laughs> minutes. And then. He's huge. But he monster. said, you can come back huge. to the truck or you can go up. I was like, no, nah, I want to go. I'm going to go up and see him. Yeah. Like, I'm, I was so excited. Um, so I walked up, but it was straight uphill and I'm like exhausted. I took a video when I get there and I'm like, (laughs) like I'm absolutely dead. So I get to it. It was like me last time. And it was, it was crazy cool just walking up on such a big animal. Isn't it awesome? I I mean, Thomas, good work. Cause that, I mean, that's a monster. I mean, it was red and I measured it over 50 inches for a Cape Kudu. That is a monster. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone, I was so excited. All of you shot great kudu. Mm-hmm. Um, probably all as good or better than anything I've ever shot, but I've never shot one as big as yours. That, that, that picture was of awesome. Drew with his arms in, in the curls. Yeah. So, like, you know, I'm up oh, there. Oh, we got to post that too. Yeah. So, yeah, kudu, so cool. there's long ones, but they can be like a corkscrew real tight. But when you get the deep curls is how you get the inches. And, you know, it's all genetics and shit. But, yeah, a picture of you putting your arms through it. And I'm looking at it. You know, I'm up there for a while. Uh, I didn't realize they went to go get more help. They went down to the farm to get more bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm up there forever by myself. I was like, they just must have a tough time getting the truck up here. But I didn't realize they left to come back. So I'm sitting with this thing for a while and looking at it. And I know nothing about kudu. So I'm like. That's cool kudu. <laughs> but like and then as soon as John gets you up have no idea. as soon as John gets up there, he's explaining it. He takes one look at it and he's like, Look at the depth and he sticks his arm down and he's like, Normally it's the size of a golf ball and he has his arm down it. And I was yeah. like, Well, that's cool. So I had to make that a picture. But no, I know the next morning Rad and I so we hadn't seen any of y'all's kudu and um Jose's was in the stuff getting all the uh, they had the skull down in some sort of mixture of stuff. Yeah, all stuff. soaking. Yeah. And um, yours was laid out with some salt on it and Rad and I rode by we're like what the hell and we got out we measured it and took pictures with it and everything I mean you could tell right away I mean, that's great I mean to me it's so funny to me because you know if you guys go back with me every year for 10 years you, you're probably never going to shoot a kudu <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so for, for you two you both shot great kudu but you know <laughs> there's you can probably shoot a bigger one maybe you? I don't mm-hmm. know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm done. I'd move on to other animals. Yeah, that's <laughs> one pretty, and done. That's pretty great. Well, I mean, yeah, what a great hunt and experience. What, what about you, Mitch? What was your best? Yeah, mine was the kudu. <laughs> <laughs> All of you. <laughs> I was your right. kudu story. <laughs> the kudu killers. It was. It was just like I don't know. I've always dreamt of hunting mountains like that and, like and shooting across a valley and dreamt and it was dudes. yeah, dreamt dreamt of dudes, dreamt of dudes. <laughs> of course. But no, it was, I mean, we, I hunted, it was just uh, my PH, Seppi and I, so it was like... Oh, really? Yeah, it just was real quiet, and we did a lot of, like, glassing from low, couldn't see anything, worked our way up the mountain and glassed over ridge after ridge. You know, we hunted pretty hard all morning, and then it was real late in the morning, and, like, the last ridge that we were looking off of, like, somehow Seppi just saw the tips of these horns moving in the grass. Isn't that They're amazing the, the when they can see, like, the tip yeah, of something? I mean, They're like, oh, there's... Yeah, like, yeah, like, literally just the tip of his horns. I mean, that's where those guys, I mean, you spend a day with them, and you're like, they deserve twice as much as they oh, make. Yeah. Like, they spot stuff you couldn't in a million years. Yeah, it's it's nuts how well-trained their eyes are. But it was just, like, the picture-perfect hunt of, like, glass and real hard... Hiking up and down mountains, and then uh, we we finally spotted him, and I was able to set up, got prone, and I'm shooting off this cliff that's like like a hundred foot cliff is what it felt like, and and uh, so you're on a rock face. Yeah, oh, love these shots. And and they're hard like, too because the wind, like I was talking yeah. about, it's not easy. Yeah, 
and he and he just sat there and it was i was behind the gun for probably 30 minutes and it was getting hot then because mm-hmm. and he didn't want to move because it's you know 11 30 in the morning it's starting to get really hot and, yeah and so i'm just staring at him through the glass and he's at like 425 yards and just waiting for my op- opportunity and finally he, he took one step out and i put one through his shoulder and pretty much reared him back and he laid oh, there. Oh, do, he do the back? Uh. Yeah, a little bit, and he was struggling I know again. I that, Thomas. And so I put, actually, I put three more shots in him because it was just like he was there, still kicking, yeah. except he told me to keep shoot, shooting. Shooting so. it. But it was cool because I put two in it. Like, all I could see was his neck down into his chest, and uh, I put two two shots, like, within an inch. You know, my second and third shot were, nice. like, right on top of each other, and then the third one just was, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that and having to, I've lost animals and mm-hmm. I've had to spend a day tracking animals and it sucks. It sucks for everybody. You feel bad because you're dragging your tracker through it. If you got a camera guy, but the pH, you end up all bit to shit, briars, everything, you're bleeding everywhere. Yeah. And, you, you know, you're just nervous the whole time and, and you could be doing something else. Um, so I believe in that. But it goes back to what you said about 300 wind mag for over there because I, I don't I don't what's a kudu 600 700 pounds potentially <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's like an elk the, yeah. yeah the big big ones are can be 600 pounds yeah, yeah. so I mean that's a giant giant animal <coughs> yeah. and you know that's a little bullet so I love 6.5 and I love the 16 inch 16 inch handy but if I'm just hunting kudu if I want a 16 inch barrel which there are the benefits which we all discussed 300 wind mag would be way better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it just would. Like a 300 wind mag is probably 800 meter gun where, you know, six fives probably 500 meter. So, yeah, I get it. So that's great. Can even, I, even PRC, 6.5 PRC or, or 300 PRC, you know, then we can, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's more like you want them, you just want to put them down. Yeah. You know, be yeah. decisive. Uh, does anybody? Your facial hair is ridiculous. Does, does anybody have to piss as bad as I do? Yes. Okay. Let's go I at the same time, <laughs> like <laughs> Africa. <laughs> all right. Unpossible fifteen gets you fifteen percent off tactical distributors. All right. These guys are idiots. I'm Kevin. This is Jay. We'll see you next time. <laughs>